everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. Let me get to my script. Um, Vice Chair Jesse Beeson is attending virtually today. Audience members, I want to start by asking you to please silence your electronic devices. I would also like to remind people that in addition to the audience in this room, we have people watching and listening online. Please consider your language in comments and testimony today. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner Brim Edwards moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Okay. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Uh, I think I don't see Commissioner Beeson yet. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I'll set a timer for two minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, at which point please wrap up your sentence. Uh, today we received 10 verbal testimonies and 26 written testimonies, which have been shared with board members and staff. I'll call four people at a time. Um, injured and pissed off. Connor Woolworth and Cliver Leonor Rodriguez Mata. Good morning. Yes, there is a injured and pissed off person. I was watching KGW eight this morning and they were talking about a blind woodsman. They had a segment on the news. There's some 5,000 people that's in the state of Oregon, according to the Oregon Commission of the Blind, uh, that's in the state of Oregon, and I'm one of them, of course. And uh, maybe the blind woodsman or other blind people will know my name, injured and pissed off. Uh, I'm sure that they would be pissed off if they'd gotten injured and with their service animal being attacked seven times in less than six years and the county and state and federal government allowing that and not getting any legal recourse to the matter. Uh, I took a picture this morning passing by the hallway in my apartment building of a apartment number 215 which is I live in 217 at 1212 Southwest Clay and the reason why I took the picture is that uh, I discussed in uh, previous uh, statements that uh, the man uh, needed air conditioner he was some five years older than me and he's passed away uh, I don't know why they put a notice on his door, I don't think he'll be reading it anymore. And another friend of mine had passed away uh, February 22nd. I'm saying in just two weeks, I've known two people personally that's passed away. And of course they say death and taxes. It isn't taxes and death, it's death and taxes. And with 3.4 million people passing away, 20% increase from 2019 nationally increase. Well, McNoma County, I suspect, is higher than that, than that 20%. Thank you. And I'll be handing in papers, one of the inspection notices. Like the I can take them, time. thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Hello, my name is Connor Woolworth. I'm the manager at the Hugo Welcome Center for Refugees. The Welcome Center, let me tell you a little bit about the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center opened up in, on November 1st, 2022, and was funded by ODHS until December 31st of this year. Since then, our management team has partnered with uh, Portland Refugee Support Group, Afghan Support Group, African CDC, and Emerge to try and best serve our refugee community. 
We have continued uh, what we call our Wednesday pop-up events, which provide assistance with immigration, healthcare, schooling for children, and medical services through the Maloma County Mobile Health Clinic. Each week, we also provide art classes, English classes, as well as providing meals through Meals on Wheels and uh, Northeast Food Pantry. In my time at the Welcome Center, I have had the pleasure of getting to know refugees from many different cultures. I have seen many smiling faces and people that are incredibly thankful for the shelter and services that we are providing. I have seen people take full advantage of their opportunity here and change their lives for the better. I truly care about everyone that comes through our doors. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning and knowing that I can be a part of someone's story and help them be successful, contributing members, members of, of the community is uh, what, what moves my entire team. That being said, because of funding, we haven't been able to house nearly as many families as we can. Our building has a capacity of 202 rooms and currently we're sitting at about 35 occupied rooms. And we would like nothing more than to utilize um, our housing availability for as many people as possible. We have great partnerships with our organizations and we have an amazing team here at the Welcome Center. And I believe through increased funding for the nonprofits, we would be able to continue changing lives and I'm hoping we can all work together to make that happen. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Eh, Good morning. Mi Rodríguez. My name is soy de nacionalidad venezolana. I am uh, from uh, Venezuela nationality. Este, hoy me siento muy contento pues, de, haber, de, de estar participando. Today I feel very happy to be participating en un espacio tan grandioso como este. In this great space like this. Eh, saludo a todos los presentes. I do um, salute all of the present. Pudiera contar un testimonio de, de que salí de mi país. I can talk a, a testimony about uh, when ah. after the time I left my country. Hasta llegar aquí. Until I uh, arrive here. Se no, se no iría el día. But it will take a whole day uh, just para to talk about that. To talk that story. O sea, yeah. desde, desde este momento le puedo decir. From this moment what I can tell you. Que la historia de cualquier emigrante. Uh, the story of any immigrant. Que salga de su país. That have to left their country. O sea, no comienza desde el momento que sale. It doesn't start when the moment they left. No, el comienzo es de que entra a los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. It is a really start when you come to the United States of America. Allí, allí está nuestro comienzo. There is the real beginning. Yo llegué a los Estados Unidos el, 20, el, entre el 19 de diciembre. I arrived to the United States on December 19. Del año pasado. Last year. Eh, tomando un proceso de, de desventaja. And it took a, uh, a disadvantage process. Porque este, estuve viviendo eh, en una iglesia. So I was living in a church. O sea, un proceso que ha sido un poco largo. It's a very long process. Para uno tratar de verle la luz al túnel. So we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Es difícil. It's very hard. Eh, llegar a un país con una mano adelante y una atrás. To get to a country pretty much with nothing on our hands. Hoy estamos dando una voz en un lugar como este. And today we are making our voices heard in a place like this. Para ver si tratamos de conseguir una mano amiga. To see if we can actually find a helping hand. Como lo dijo el amigo aquí ahorita en el momento. My friend said here o sea, at the moment. De ayudar. To help a esa familia que vienen llegando those families who are arriving en condiciones muy deplorables in very deplorable conditions y le pedimos encarecidamente now, when we do ask very uh, que nos puedan tender esa mano that you guys can uh, tend to us that helping hand a toda esa comunidad de migrantes to all of that immigrant que community está llegando a los that are arriving now to the United States gracias next we have Michael Harrison Bruce Barnes Rachel Shin and Alyssa Caldwell. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, fellow commissioners. My name is Dr. Alyssa Caldwell. 
I'm here today to express my support of the proclamation in honor of National Abortion Provider Appreciation Day. I stand here before you today as an OBGYN physician, mother, and Oregonian with a heart full of appreciation for our Multnomah County. Today is a day to acknowledge the importance of abortion as healthcare and the crucial role it plays in the lives of pregnancy-capable individuals and families. As an abortion provider, I'm deeply thankful for the unwavering support of Multnomah County and the political protections that allow me to continue providing this essential care. During medical school, I was fortunate to rotate at the local Planned Parenthood clinic where I was welcomed by individuals who had only met me that day but allowed me to learn from their abortion experience. I am forever in debt to those patients that trusted me to be a part of their healthcare team and ultimately changed the trajectory of my life, inspiring my career path. I remember the exact moment I learned that Roe was no longer the law of the land from experiencing immense devastation of the realization that a safe legal abortion was no longer accessible to a large number of American citizens, rose the inspiration to create an elective rotation for physicians in training in states with regressive abortion bans to receive comprehensive abortion training here in our community. As we adjust to this new reality, I am proud of the work that we've been able to do at OHSU, not only to provide care, but to educate medical fellows, residents, and medical students who are studying at OHSU and at institutions across the country in complex contraception and abortion care. The reality is that this education ensures we have a future generation of abortion providers. Your commitment to seeing abortion as basic health care and ensuring access to reproductive rights is nothing short of extraordinary. In a time when reproductive rights are under constant threat, our community stands as a beacon of hope where individuals can access the care they need without fear or judgment. Thank you for your commitment in protecting this right for individuals. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson, commissioners in our community gathered here today. My name is Dr. Rachel Shin and my pronouns are she, her. I am here today in support of the proclamation in honor of National Day of Appreciation for Abortion Providers. I moved to Portland to complete advanced training in abortion and contraception care. I am honored to stand before you today to share my experiences as an OBGYN and abortion provider. I grew up as a Korean American in a traditionally conservative household where conversations about abortion were virtually non-existent. It wasn't until medical school when I was randomly placed on a rotation at Planned Parenthood that fate intervened. I witnessed the care these patients received and what it meant for them to practice their reproductive agency, and I was hooked. I couldn't see myself doing anything other than becoming an abortion provider. Nearly a decade later, I am so grateful to find myself in Portland, Oregon, in a community where progressive attitudes toward reproductive rights are celebrated and supported. Over the last eight months, I have had the honor of learning from experts using evidence-based medicine to practice and influence policy. Every day, I learn from so many others, from nurses, administrative staff, and colleagues in other fields who all work tirelessly to provide safe abortion care. And every day, we are supported by Portland's community of grassroots advocates, local leaders, and organizations committed to this cause. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention I have learned so much from my patients who have crossed county, state, and even country borders to access the care they so deserve. Whether they see me with fear, joy, sorrow, conflict, or indifference, it is from my patients that I have learned one of the most important principles in abortion care thus far, that choosing abortion is an act of love. I see individuals facing difficult circumstances, making considerate and thoughtful choices out of love for themselves and their current or future families. As an abortion provider, I witness this love and courage every day. Just as in any other realm of medical care, I trust my patients' wisdom and their fundamental right to decide what is best for themselves and their bodies. It takes immense collaboration to uphold the autonomy and dignity of every person who walks through our doors. I'd like to recognize the individuals who dedicate themselves to provide and fight for abortion care in a society where reproductive rights are still contested. Thank you, Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning, commissioners. For the record, my name is Michael Harrison. I'm speaking on behalf of Portland's bicycling demographic. Uh, the e-bike industry is growing. It's projected to reach over 100 billion by 2030. We're only going to see more e-bikes and bicycles on our streets here in Portland. Although I appreciate the minimal bicycle pathways we have, we really need to look into elevated bicycle infrastructure. 
Elevated me, meaning physically placed above the ground or a conventional car traffic grid. I have an unofficial signed petition with 500 signatures I have collected that I'm delivering in support of a raised bicycle platform for Portland. These signatures were collected at the PSU Farmers Market in the summer of 2022. Generally speaking, the public seems to like the idea of a bicycle skyway system from what I can tell at my petition signing events. Other cities are either proposing or have similar infrastructure elsewhere around the world. We need to take this kind of infrastructure much more seriously. Uh, this is not a luxury or a novelty, this is a necessity. There are a few locations in the Portland area that can use this kind of infrastructure, which in this case extends for several miles. It can increase commercial retail traffic if the off-ramps are nearby. With costs rising, for example, gas, car insurance, car payments, repairs, the bicycle industry and bicycle infrastructure are a much more affordable form of transportation. It equates out to more cash in the pockets of the average consumer. I have given public testimony to Portland City Council and Metro Council about this too. If you have any questions, there's more information in these signed petitions and packets I'm delivering. Thank you for your time. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and County Council. My name is Bruce Barnes, for the record. Um, I'm here to speak on a few different things today. One of them that really uh, is disturbing to me, which was last Thursday's uh, County Council meeting, um, you all have a code of conduct that the commission goes through and a, and a code of ethics. And some of the comments that were made last week were extremely disturbing to me, as I'm quite sure they were disturbing to you and racist comments that I honestly couldn't believe that the council put up with. And to be called white supremacists, uh, white privileged, white this, white that, Nazis, whatever the case may be, there's a whole diverse crowd here and nobody wants to hear that, including myself. Uh, I think we can all do better at the next council meeting because nobody wants to come to a council meeting and be verbally attacked or attacked by the color of their skin. Nobody in this room would be. And so that'd be my first thing. The second thing I would like to talk about is the, again, the $28 million tiny home project that nobody seems to know where the money went to. Uh, I'd like to get some response from you guys of where that money went to for that tiny home additional dwelling unit that they only produced five homes out of that $28 million. The third thing I would like to urge you to do is not fund any more nonprofit groups, as we saw with Measure 110, uh, all our elected officials in, in uh, Salem took money from the Drug Alliance and other people to line their pockets with campaign contributions from nonprofit companies and didn't overturn it until they were forced to by you know public outcry. And you can see what that bill did to our community here and Portland through Salem and everywhere else, right? Harm reduction is not harm reduction. It's, it's, it's harming our community. Giving out drug needles to the tune of seven and a half million drug needles to people in the community doesn't do any positive for it. It only harms Thank it. Thank you for your time. We have two more in person, Melanie Plot and Lightning. Chair Vega Peterson, commissioners, thank you for giving me time to testify today. My name is Melanie Plout. I'm a retired OBGYN doctor and I volunteer with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. The weather is warming, thank goodness. And I am about to plant some seeds in my community garden. Gardeners need to think ahead and so do county commissioners or opportunities are lost. I'd like you to plant the seed to clean up the climate and air pollution created by methane burning heating equipment. California jurisdictions have already taken action on this health issue by putting in place air quality standards for newly purchased furnaces and water heaters. It is time for Multnomah County to take on this issue and explore similar options. I ask you to schedule a quick vote on this simple resolution before the end of April. Burning fossil fuels in Multnomah County homes and businesses releases about 1,000 tons of harmful NOx into the outdoor environment each year. This is about 25% of the state's 
total emissions. We know well the health risks of these substances and regulate the same pollution from cars and power plants. We should be looking at outdoor emissions from heating equipment in buildings in a similar fashion to clean our air over time. Please note that this is an environmental justice issue. Studies have found that low income and BIPOC communities are disproportionately affected by air pollution, increasing asthma, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and premature birth. By establishing clean air standards for appliances, the county can reduce these health risks and mitigate disproportionate impacts on vulnerable populations. Thank you for your attention, for all your hard work, and for tending the garden. We have um, Lightning and Jared Essig. Yes. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Humanity X. Again, I'm still a little bit mystified on that supported, supportive housing services measure on Metro trying to cannibalize your money like a bunch of vultures. And they're using the terms that we don't think they know how to spend their money. To Metro, I think that's pathetic to insult my good friends at Multnomah County. And I do not think that you should even begin to try to take their money that they deserve, that they've been working to try to come out with a plan across the board, which takes time, and now you're throwing a wrench right in the middle of it. I'm actually amazed. And to President Peterson, if you move forward on this, I will personally begin to recall you. I will begin a recall effort because what you're trying to do is something that should not be done. Any additional money from, the, say, the $240 million a year up to maybe the $340 million a year, which may be expected, should be divided between the counties end of discussion for you to step in and insult my friends, the fellow Multnomah County commissioners, and then try to grab their money and stop them from doing what they want to do is insultive. If you want more money for affordable housing, go for another bond. Go for another bond. But do not come back make changes that the voters already put into place and insult my fellow commissioners. I'm offended, President Peterson, and I will recall you if you take any of their money. Thank you. Jared Essig. Good morning, Chair Peterson, board, citizens of Multnomah County. I'd love to speak to you about bicycling and clean air and uh, housing and camping geographic, economic mobility, recovery from addiction and all these things. But right now, I have to speak to you about my Middle East peace plan because I promised to bring it yesterday or last week. Um, starts with a Hebrew and Arabic language exchange, which none of the activists last, who showed up last week wanted to, wanted to start with me. And it also starts with a, an end to the war against Israel. That's basically the nutshell of the Middle East peace plan stop the war against Israel. Now, to do that, you have to stop the libels and the incitements, but you also have to stop financing Palestinian terrorism by sending American tax dollars to the Palestinian Authority Martyrs Fund to give subsidies for, through its egregious pay to slay program. There's already been a bipartisan letter sent last July. I ask you to endorse this letter. The political work is already done. It should be easy to endorse this. Now, last week, as you know, the board adopted a de-escalation and ceasefire resolution. They called for, quote, an immediate ceasefire, return of hostages, safe passage, and free access for humanitarian bracket relief to Gazan civilians, end quote. Although the board did not explicitly mention Israeli hostages, this was clearly implied, and the amended resolution deliberately rejected a key demand of the pro-Palestinian activists over their vocal protests in the meeting itself that a call for the release of the Palestinian prisoners be included in the final version. 
However, the following day's Oregonian newspaper mistakenly reports that the final version called for the, quote, release of Israeli and Palestinian hostages. This is a blood libel invented by the Oregonian put into the words of the commission itself. This falsely equivalent language was requested by all the activists allied with the PFLP Samadun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network who have been shutting down bridges and streets for the last couple of months and flooding public meeting with their demands and their libels. It's also the language the Oregonian reporters would have liked to have seen, apparently, but it's not what the resolution actually says. Therefore, for the consent agenda, I ask you to adopt an amended version of the resolution immediately or be complicit with the blood libel. I've already proposed this. Um, it's in my written testimony. Please consider it immediately. Next, we have online uh, testimony from Anne Pernick. Anne, you're unmuted on my end. You have to unmute on your end, and you may begin. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you. Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners and staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ann Pernick and I'm with Safe Cities at Stand at Earth, working with local government leaders and advocates to pass policies to phase out fossil fuels. I live in Multnomah County, so while I get to work with leaders all over the US and Canada as part of the Safe Cities team, I really want the place where you and I live to move off fossil fuels. Gas leaks at the school itself or in the neighborhood have been an issue at both elementary and middle school for my child. I want to thank you for uh, I want to thank you all and the county staff's leadership on confronting the fossil fuel industry, including on the dangers of fossil fuels in our buildings. This leadership includes the health department's significant report on the dangers of burning methane gas in our buildings in 2022, and last year the county suing fossil fuel companies over the devastating 2021 heat dome. There's a clear next step. I urge you to direct staff to develop policies to transition homes and other buildings in the county to clean electric alternatives, moving our buildings off fossil fuels that contribute to heat domes and other extreme weather events and harm health, safety, and climate. Thank you very much. Our next public testimony is from, um, sorry, one second, uh, Gracia Anahi Segovia, Rodriguez, you are unmuted and you may begin. Hello, can you can you speak? Yes, sorry. Oh, we can hear you, you have two minutes. Perfect, thank you. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson and Multnomah County Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Grecia Segovia Rodriguez and I am a lifelong resident of Outer Southeast Portland and I am also the Energy Justice Coordinator at Verde, a nonprofit based in Northeast Portland focused on environmental justice. I am testifying today to urge Multnomah County Commissioners to adopt equitable policies that would allow the phasing out of gas appliances from home. According to an article on the Multnomah County website posted on May 3rd, 2021 for Air Awareness Week, Multnomah County residents, and I quote, breathe the dirtiest air in the state and face the highest risk of pollution-related cancer from air toxics. Low-income and BIPOC communities are, are even greater danger. These communities are disproportionately exposed to higher levels of ambient fine uh, particulate air pollution due to the fact that many live in areas where there are higher risks of air pollution and are more likely to use gas appliances, causing an even higher risk of asthma and cancer in children and adults. Once again, I ask you to consider equitable policies that take the environment and the health of Multnomah County residents into account. Thank you for your time and consideration. That is all the public testimony we have today. I'll move on to R1. R1. Approval of 2024-2028 Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner uh, Brim Edwards seconds. Approval of R1. So Marina, I believe we have a slide presentation for this. Thank you. So I'm gonna kick us off today and then I'll turn it over to our panel. Today we take an important step forward in being the workplace our employees and community deserve. We meet this moment at a time when other counties, governments, and boards are disinvesting in this kind of work. 
when to me there has been no more important time to deepen investment and commitment to diversity and equity. So I'm proud that's not what we're doing, that instead we are continuing to push deeper into what workforce equity can be and why. As stated in the West renewal, Multnomah County is not exempt from our nation's legacy of white supremacy culture and its institutions, policies, structures, and systems of care. This legacy furthers racial, furthers racial disparities <clears throat> in our community and our workforce. The county is committed to inclusively leading with race to fulfill our promise to address racism within our workforce and the community. For me, that's what the West renewal is for and what it's about, to hold a clear vision and strategic plan for creating the workplace we all want to be a part of. Because when we are working towards these outcomes, outcomes that are centered on increased responsibility and accountability, we will be able to bring those same values to our work, relationships, and those we serve. I believe in the future of a healthy workforce that builds supportive systems and fosters equitable experience for the more than 6,000 people who work for and at Multnomah County. The work of Multnomah County relies on us as individuals to reflect the values, cultures, and communities we're a part of. It relies on our ability as an organization to support and uplift these values. It requires us to build systems of accountability to ensure that this work continues to happen. Today, we'll hear more about this call to action. And through that, you have my commitment as county chair to focus investments in support of the work that we lay out in this West renewal, to continue to invest county dollars in West implementation and the prioritization of complementary projects like our current work to renew our mission, vision, and values for the first time in nearly a decade. <laughs> I hope as you digest this renewed WESP, you will find opportunities to engage and feel called to participate. I hope it reflects the workplace you have experienced and what you hope it to become. I hope it calls you in and makes space for your leadership. Because the work we consider today isn't a static document but the starting point of an ongoing and vital implementation process where we do the work of bringing this plan alive. This West presentation, the West document, the implementation plan, none of it would have been possible without the leadership of countless employees from every corner and level of the county over the course of many years and many recent, month, many recent weeks and months. Times when people stood alone or together and we're willing to look harder at how the impacts of racism, anti-blackness, and systems of oppression change and warp our ability to do the work that we, want, that we want to do. Times when we considered alone or together what we could do to reverse some of those impacts and the entrenched natures of those, of those systems. I wanna thank every single Multnomah County employee for the ways you have and will continue to show up for this effort. Thank you to the dozens of leaders who have prioritized discussion, thought, and reflection since we began the renewal process. Thank you to every single West Renewal Steering Committee member for your voice and your leadership. You have made something possible here that would not have been possible without you. Thank you to the Office of Diversity, Equity, Director Joy Fowler, and every member of the staff, all of whom have been working long hours to make the plan we share today happen all of whom will be instrumental in taking it forward into implementation from here. Thank you to equity teams, managers, and leaders across our departments who help us put forward these initiatives as a, as a key part of your job duties. Lastly, thank you to this board for the continued support of the WESP, for helping to pass this investment in our FY24 budget, and for helping to lead a county with this value system from here. I'm happy now to turn the presentation over to Joy and today's many other presenters and look forward to everything that you have to share with us today. Wonderful. Good morning. Next slide, please. Good morning, Chair, and thank you, and good morning, Commissioners, and good morning to everyone assembled here today. Uh, for the record, my name is Joy Fowler. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Chief Diversity and Equity Officer for the Office of Diversity and Equity. And I am thrilled about the reason that we are here today. Uh, it has been long awaited by everyone at the county, not just select few. Um, I'm really excited to be here with uh, my co-members of the executive committee. And so we will just dive right in uh, and you will get a chance to hear from uh, the two of them. So first uh, we'll go to the next slide and then I will turn it over to Serena. 
Thanks so much, Joy. Good morning, everyone. Chair Vega Peterson, commissioners, for the record, my name is Serena Cruz. I am your chief operating officer, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Joy, thank you. Um, that is where I want to start, uh, is by expressing thanks. And Chair Vega Peterson did such a beautiful job of it as Joy, but I will echo my thanks to everyone who was involved uh, in creating this West Renewal Plan. Joy, oh my God, Joy, her team at the Office of Diversity, Equity, um, and obviously every single steering committee member, the subject matter experts, work group members, all of the folks across this organization who engaged in this critical work of building the plan that's before you today. Just a huge, huge thank you, uh, echoing what has been said already. When it comes to equity in our workplace, the process and our progress, I think are as important as the destination that we're trying to reach. We don't get to choose the environment uh, where we launch this work. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a former Governor Barbara Roberts saying, you don't get to choose your backdrop. And she said this as Oregon's first woman governor uh, when she had all sorts of ambitious plans uh, and instead of being able to launch them, there was a recession. And so that was the backdrop for her um, thing and it's what she gets remembered for instead of all of the initiatives that she tried to do. We didn't get to choose um, the backdrop when the world entered a pandemic a year after launching the first WESP. We did, even in the spite of that backdrop, accomplished a lot and we learned so much more through the work of doing that equity plan against the, the backdrop of the pandemic. You'll hear today, this renewal plan is shaped up and down by the lessons we've learned from the last few years and the evolving picture of our future. To address so many of the barriers and issues that keep us from moving closer to our vision of a just and equitable workplace isn't just an ask anymore. It's an expectation. One that I believe our organization is as ready as ever we've been to honor the best of our capabilities and resources. Speaking as your chief operating officer, I am fully committed to helping our departments and programs implement the benchmarks over the next four years. The organization will be in a different place by the end of this cycle, just as we are today in a very different place than we were in 2019. This plan gives us the blueprint that we need to make sure we're all aligned in the same direction toward an equitable Multnomah County. And so I am ready to get to work right alongside everyone in this plan, especially my colleagues on the steering committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. And thank you, Chair Vega Peterson and County Commissioners. Uh, my name is Travis Brown. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer at Multnomah County, and I use he, him pronouns. Grateful to be here today. Today, my brief remarks will be centered around gratitude and support. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for the 30 plus members of the West uh, Steering Committee for their dozens and dozens of hours of work spanning many months. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Mary Lee for her facilitation of the process, our wonderful ERG leaders, our wonderful department equity managers, and the outstanding staff of the Office of Diversity and Equity, and especially to our Chief Diversity and Equity Officer, Joy Fowler, Joy's resilience and commitment to this work is inspiring, and I am truly grateful for the partnership that we have formed between HR and ODE. As the county's chief human resources officer, I strongly support the renewal of the Multnomah County Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. This plan is a testament to the county's commitment to building a just and inclusive workplace that reflects the diversity of our community. The tireless work of county employees in developing the WESP, driven by their profound dedication to racial equity, has resulted in a plan that promises meaningful change. The objectives found within the West recommendations are inspiring and will serve as a North Star for all employees, especially new and prospective employees because they are a reflection of our values. By implementing these recommendations, the Multnomah County will take tangible steps towards creating a workplace where all employees feel valued, respected, and empowered to reach their full potential. In partnership with the Office of Diversity and Equity, Human Resources is fully committed to the implementation of these recommendations. This renewal is a critical investment in the future of Multnomah County. 
ensuring that equity and opportunity remain at the forefront of the county's purposes and strategic objectives. Thank you again to my wonderful colleagues for your outstanding work. Well, thank you both because this was definitely, as I like to have, as I have been calling it, a labor of love, and I could not have been on a journey without the two of you. So thank you both. Um, you know, as part of this committee, I was honored to witness the work that was accomplished by all of the individuals that were mentioned. Um, you know, to see collaboration, engagement, and thought, um, it took an immense amount of intellectual capacity, and I just want to raise that up and acknowledge that, and just thank everyone for that because we know it was a heavy lift. Those engaged in this renewal process were diverse with representation. That included race, yes, but definitely spanned beyond race to include gender, gender identity, represented individuals, non-represented individuals, managers, non-managers, employee resource groups, and departments. When we recognized as a team that we did not have the representation or saw it lagging, what did we do? We pivoted, and we did that so that others could participate that did not have the opportunity to. Um, I love that I heard our chair say that strategic plans are not static. That was like music to my ears because I have been saying it since June, and you will probably hear me say it in perpetuity. Hopefully I'll be here in perpetuity, but you know, <laughs> I will continue to say that. Strategic plans in general are not meant to be static or unchanging, and we completely expect the West to be no different. There is a, if there is a feasibility concern, a benchmark that needs adjusting, or a performance measure that is off, trust and believe the Office of Diversity and Equity and the Implementation Committee and this committee will act and we will act in a way so that we are ensuring that um, this WESP is different than the previous one. I want to thank, because I think it's very important that I also take time to um, thank the mill for their facilitation and unwavering support, my team, Oh my gosh, when you talk about a unified force, and that's what I'm calling us, we are that. We are modeling the behavior, and I could not thank them more for their effort in terms of holding us accountable as a team, which is what we agreed to commit to when we started this process. The communications team, because you wouldn't have all of the beautiful things you have now without Paul, Sarah, and Jeanette. So thanking them to help um, really pull together to start our journey that we call the WESP is really important. And then, of course, even though I thanked you already, Serena and Travis, um, your partnership was incredible. And I know that the journey is just beginning. This is just the start. We are not finished, and so this was kind of the, uh, what do they call the downslope on the roller coaster as we ramp up to get started again, and we are going to do it. And last but definitely not least, um, Chair Vega Peterson, um, your support and commitment during this entire process has been so incredibly awesome, and I just thank you immensely because we couldn't have gotten here without your sponsorship. You could have said no, you could have said not now, you could have said a multitude of things because of all the other things that you are experiencing and going through as a county, and you did not. You said go forward, and we did that, and so we thank you for that. Um, you know, this process was a complete shift from the norm, and I want to call that out. It engaged all groups that were mentioned. It was incredibly inclusive, offering a fully hybrid option, which from my understanding, it has never been done before, and we are incredibly impressed and pleased with how that turned out. The, uh, there was a lot of authenticity, there was transparency, there was truth, a lot of truth. Um, and that does not happen in most organizations. I wanna call that out because we are a unique entity and we should definitely be proud. As we prepare to share the multiple aspects of what went uh, into this West renewal, I wanna take a moment to uh, pivot and share the agenda. So if I can have you go to the next slide, please. Here you see, um, we obviously have done a couple of introductions. We'll continue to do more throughout this time frame. We'll take a moment to uh, do previous highlights and successes. We'll go over the renewal process. We'll, you'll hear from our work groups and other individuals, as well as our phased approach, and then we will close for you all to have any comments or questions, uh, because we wanna make sure that we're completely transparent, allowing for that. 
So uh, the WESP is a plan that is expected to impact employees at all levels of the county. And I wanna take a minute to share a little bit about our vision. And so we can go to the next slide. And at this time, you can stay, you can, whatever works for you. <laughs> Do you want others to join? Yeah, they will be joining, join joining. once okay. I'm done. Yes, okay. absolutely. Oh, we'll, we'll wait till we're finished. We'll be here waiting. So as you've heard, um, the WESP is one of the county's most critical plans. We see the WESP uh, as a living document that we want to speak to every employee regardless of their level within this organization. We also see this plan as progress, progress from the initial WESP, recognition that we still have room for improvement and we have an understanding that as a living document, we expect and anticipate course correction over the four years for ongoing improvement. This process that we went through does in fact not only prepare us for the next four years, but it also prepares us for the future. All of this incorporates what our office sees as our vision while having the expectation that barriers are reduced. Our black indigenous and staff of color, including managers of color, experience a sense of belonging, a sense of professional growth, eradication of anti-blackness. We thrive, that we thrive as a result of our actions, not just our words that are written on paper, and that we have a more effective, efficient, accountable, and progressive workforce equity strategic plan. So that is what I wanted to share with you regarding our vision. At this point, um, we're gonna take a moment to highlight uh, some successes, and I wanna make sure that I get a chance to turn it over to Alejandro Juarez. Um, so I will bring my team, and thank you all for, um, come on up. And so if I can, oh, you're already at the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank <morning>. you, Marina. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Alejandro Juarez. I'm the Workforce Equity Manager with the Office of Diversity and Equity. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I identify as Latine and queer. Um, we're about to get into the weeds right now in terms of uh, you know some, some data and some background on the WESP. Um, thank you for having us today. Um, I want to you know like recognize your continued support throughout this process, but then also the commitment to diversity and inclusion and, and equity at Multnomah County. Um, I have been at, at Multnomah County for uh, since 2016 and have been part of the WESP in one shape or form or another. Um, from working in the health department as in the health department's equity office to joining organizational learning in central HR and now as the workforce equity manager. Through my career at Multnomah County, I have been able to witness how the organization has grown and evolved on equity over the last five, seven years. Uh, the West has always been ambitious and at times it's been overwhelming in its scope. Because of this, I, I want to um, recognize our past state and talk, um, talk a little bit about um, where we are now and then and discuss like what we what we'd like to see in the future first um, before we begin that I want to recognize the role that employees played in raising awareness and demanding that Multnomah County recognize and acknowledge the issues with racism that employees face in the workplace the employees of color ERG spearheaded the work that involved a broad coalition of county partners including Ask Me Local 88 and community organizations we would not be here today without the work, commitment, and sacrifice that employees of color engaged in seven years ago. Their efforts had a monumental impact on the culture uh, of the county for all employees. The movement for workforce equity inspired our organization to rethink the ways we engage and support our employees of color and other protected groups such as employees with disabilities and our employees who identify as LGBTQI. A2S plus. <laughs> um, employees took, uh, took risk in 2016 because Multnomah County had a diversity problem. Community organizations raised concerns about the services we were providing to communities of color because our staff did not reflect the communities that they were serving. We were over 70% over um, white and our employees of color were too often the only person of color on their teams. This created a culture where microaggressions and discrimination went unaddressed, making it a hostile workplace for employees of color. Next slide, please. The goals of the original West were to increase diversity for the organization, both in its represented workforce and managerial levels. In addition to, um, to addressing protected class complaints and shifting the culture of the organization. However, we adopted a plan, but did not have the infrastructure to be able to execute it. In order to meet those benchmarks of the original West, we had to invest in this infrastructure. This slide, 
describes the, infra uh, the infrastructure that was built over the last seven years to implement our workforce equity efforts. We established the Complaints Investigations Unit, created an equ equity minor positions in every department, including the uh, DA's office and the Sheriff's office, and expanded organizational learning, and reorganized the Office of Diversity and Equity to include a workforce equity branch and a policy unit. Next slide, please. This infrastructure and these efforts um, had shifted the demographics of the county to where employees of color now make up nearly 40% of our workforce. Next slide. In addition, we have ne nearly closed the gap in opportunities for promotion for employees of color, where we are now promoting employees of color at the nearly the same rate as white employees. This brings us to our current state. While, while our increase in diversity is exciting and definitely something to celebrate, we have learned that diversity is not enough. With an increase in diversity, we have, been, we have become aware of the ways that our organization was not built to sustain or support diversity. The question today is, how do we move forward to protect our investment in diversity and ensure that we can retain employees of color while allowing them to thrive in the workplace? Next slide. So in reflection on our, on our presentation today, I came to the realization that, workforce, that the, the West and workforce equity at Multnomah County is not just a project or a strategic plan, but it's a movement and it's now an institution. We have an equity infrastructure that spans across the entire organization that, that we can leverage not merely to react to equity concerns, but to now predict and prevent them. In order to move into this next chapter, we will need to increase collaboration across the county, provide predictable and intentional funding vehicles for workforce equity efforts, and commit to regular evaluations and reporting. Together, these efforts will help us fulfill our internal county mission of, of safety, trust, and belonging for all employees. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Mariana. Thank you, Ale. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Mariana Parra. I go by Mari for short. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and identify as Latina and Mayan. I'm the strategic, policy, uh, strategic Initiatives Policy Analyst for the Office of Diversity and Equity, with a main focus on the West renewal process and future implementation. For this renewal process, we worked with a large uh, committee representing uh, diverse staff and managers from all departments, including staff from the Chair's Office, the, chair, the Sheriff's Office, the DA's Office, Union, and subject matter experts that provided culturally specific consultation. The committee was made up of 32 um, employees, over 20 subject matter experts, and three work groups, LGBTQIA2S+, Disability Equity, and Managers of Color. The steering committee kicked off with a two-day retreat um, last uh, summer, June 2023, where committee members came up with community care agreements, decision-making practices, and key topic areas that the renewal process should address. During the five two-day work sessions between July and November of 2023, steering committee members and subject matter experts worked together to co-create recommendations for the key topic areas. Each session was facilitated by Mary Lee and Ju Young Oh from the Multnomah Idea Lab, also known as the Mill. Uh, their unique facilitation tools and expertise, along with their equity lens and human-centered design approach, supported our team throughout this entire process. They ensured we dedicated the time needed to discuss the issues each topic presented. I just want to take a quick moment just to share my appreciation for their partnership and leadership in creating a space for all involved to create relationships and trust and to navigate hard conversations. Thank you. Next slide. Um, here I will share a brief overview of each of the topics um, we covered, which we now refer to as initiatives on the report. Um, just for brief reference, the previous was included focus areas, and with the expansion of the topic areas for this process, we moved them to initiatives because we see them as the next level of goals we need to achieve to demonstrate progress as one county. Initiative one, accountability. These benchmarks encompass the development of standardized assessments and the track in, tracking of employee responsibilities for applying equity values within the workplace. Initiative two, infrastructure. These benchmarks reflect the commitment to ongoing improvement and adaptation, ensuring the infrastructure that supports our equity efforts involves the e equity efforts evolves to meet the changing needs of our organization and employees. 
Initiative three, retention. These benchmarks address disparities in retention, including evaluation and data collection, which are pivotal to tracking progress. Next slide. And here you have the last three topics, uh, sorry, last four topics plus one, which unfortunately uh, we missed adding to these slides, but you can find on page 47 of the 2024-2028 West Report. We sincerely apologize for the oversight. Uh, initiative four, training. These benchmarks expand equity concepts by modifying employee training, leadership development, and onboarding experiences. Initiative five, data. These benchmarks ensure that data collection efforts, um, efforts accurately reflect the diversity of the workforce. Initiative six, evaluation and policy. These benchmarks call for an evaluation of culturally specific needs of LGBTQIA2S plus community members and community members with disabilities. They enhance policies to improve employee wellness and culturally responsive services. Initiative seven, compensation. The, this benchmark assesses and analyzes the roles in the context of equity, which include, includes the reclassification or establishment of a classification for county equity practitioners. Um, and then the last one, Initiative H, which is not reflected on this slide, is standard practice. These benchmarks are focused on adapting precautionary and trauma-informed practices for workforce equity and exploring targeted approaches for each um, department. This aids in ensuring consistency countywide. Um, next slide. Next, I'll just uh, highlight our equity, uh, our, sorry, I'll highlight our engagement efforts throughout this process. Our primary goals were to increase communication and transparency countywide and to ensure participation from employee resource groups and county partners who were charged with implementing the original WESP. We fostered a process that encouraged collaboration, feedback, and questions. Some of the strategies we used included building a, a project progress and resource website, which is accessible on our county's public website. After each session, our ODE team uh, would take all the notes and data that uh, we collected throughout each work session, compile them into captured uh, into captures to be shared more broadly across the county. Um, and that was via steering committee members, um, ERG leaders, and subject matter experts. Each capture was then followed by a brief summary article, which was featured in the Wednesday Wire. We briefed key internal partners, including um, elected officials, county um, leadership, um, HR executives, uh, ERG leaders, and department equity managers. And most recently, we hosted two forums that were focused on ERG forum uh, on ERGs that uh, was open to also all county staff. Both forums were attended by um, nearly 200 employees. Um, now I want us to move uh, to our next part of our presentation where you'll hear directly from steering um, committee members on their experience being part of this process. Thank Alrighty, you. so now we'll bring uh, Joseph Allman and Albany Bell up to the dais, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Whichever one of you would like to go first. I, oh, yeah. is it Joseph or me? Yeah, sure. Whichever one you. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson, Commissioner Brim Edwards, Commissioner Segment, Commissioner Myron. I think I saw Commissioner Beeson online. Uh, my name is Ebony Bell. Um, I'm African American. I use she, her pronouns. I used to work for the Multnomah Idea Lab. I'm here today to talk to you about the WESP and the process of its creation. Um, I joined the library back in 2007. At that time, I faced uh, racial harassment daily from one of my colleagues. And I apologize to my steering committee members who have had to hear this story so many times, but um, I wanna give a context for why I joined uh, the Employees of Color ERG. Um, I wasn't able to protect myself from the racial discrimination that I experienced. Um, in fact, it was a white woman at the library who went and reported it, and um, that woman was Katie O'Dell. And she, uh, she made sure that I would have a place at the library. As bad as that experience during my probationary year was, and I believe it was my colleague's intent to push me out during that year, um, I understand myself to have been incredibly fortunate in that someone had my back, someone stood up for me. And that's 
part of why I'm here today, and it's also why I, enjoy, I joined the Employees of Color ERG, to make sure that that kind of discrimination and that kind of pushing people of color out during their probationary years wouldn't continue to happen. I joined the Employees of Color ERG, and um, when Raymond became chair, Raymond De Silva, we um, started working on an effort to look at the retention of employees of color during their probationary years. At that time, the Civil Rights Administrator, Jonathan, he rendered into a sort of legalese some of the things that we had been talking about in those employees of color meetings. One of the things that we identified was that we wanted to have equity managers at each of the departments within Multnomah County. At that time, only the health department and the library had equity managers. We, we understood when we produced that document the limitations of something written to produce change within the county, but we went ahead with that format anyway. When we adopted the WESP, I was here in front of the board presenting at that time, and I told the story of a young man named Anthony. Anthony was a handsome young man. He was African American, he was six foot four, and he was over 300 pounds. And when he joined the, the county, he said, he came to the ERG, the employees of color, and he said, there are all these people who are threatened by my size and I think I'm gonna end up losing my job. Well, when I testified, <laughs> that's okay. When I testified here the first time, I had to report that he did get pushed out during his probationary period. Um, at that time, I wasn't able to protect him then, and I, I don't know if I would be able to protect him or if the West would be able to protect him now. I continue to do the work of working on the West because I think it's important to try to create change through these documents. And I'm happy that I got to work on the West Steering Committee. Um, we went for two days each month, full days, and um, I felt fine during those, those days, but I would go home and I would crash each and every single time. It took a lot of work to um, think about all of these strategies, accountability, retention, all of those things that we centered our work on. Um, sometimes we worked in affinity groups. There was an African-American affinity group and we, we sat for hours trying to figure out how do we word this? How do we talk about what black managers are experiencing at the county? And finally, what we came up with was anti-blackness. And that finds its way into the new WESP. And I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, I also still recognize the limitations of a document to produce the kinds of change we wanna see. It's not possible for a document to legislate out or, or strategic plan away anti-blackness. That's up to every single individual at the county. First, we have to recognize the ways that anti-blackness shows up within the workplace. And then we have to rid our, ourselves of the sense of superiority that anti-blackness lends to its practitioners. Unless we do that, we'll continue to have anti-blackness at the county. I worked for a work group, the Multnomah Idea Lab, whose strategy it was to center approaches at the intersection of poverty and racism. That work group has been cut, and so now it's up to every single one of you at the county to take on that as your mission, the elimination of racism at the intersection of poverty. I want everyone to make that their mission. The work of the mill is everyone's work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To the chair and commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Joseph Almond. I am the organizational learning manager here at the county. I have the pleasure of serving under Central HR. So we're really excited to be in partnership with ODE. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my experience with the West Renewal. The steering committee was amazing. I love the fact that ODE laid a great foundation for us to be successful. And even more so, they were wise enough to work in tandem or collaboration, or I like to say in concert with the Monoma County Idea Lab, which kept us on the right path. As you could imagine, several of us in one room moving toward a common goal, we could have a tendency to get off the rails a little bit. And I'm so grateful for Mary Lee and her team 
and how they were able to keep us focused so that we can get to the point where we do have recommendations. The biggest concern that I have is that recommendations are great, but now it's about implementation once approved. And with that being said, the implementation as I look at um, one of the items, number four, is training, right? When, how, we, how do we phrase it, initiatives? Mm -hmm. And one of our initiatives is number four, training, which falls into our ballpark here within organizational learning. So our goal is to take it from recommendation to implementation, and we're gonna do that through education. We wanna educate the entire county, 6,000 plus individuals, as was mentioned a moment ago, how we move everyone forward, understanding that we're all in a different spaces and times. So that came strongly across in our steering committee meetings. I heard a lot of wonderful things in the steering committee meetings, and I also heard some very painful testimonials. So I asked myself, how do I feel and what was I thinking? This is something that was asked of us by Mary Lee and her team at the end of every session. Tell me one thing you're thinking, one thing you're feeling. So to keep that alive with the meal, I'll say this. There was a portion where I was feeling excited and enlightened by the wonderful colleagues that I had the pleasure of sharing this experience with. But then there was also a time where I felt frustrated and that was my time to buckle up and trust the process because I could not see the end of the tunnel. I'm looking at ODE, I'm looking at the mill saying, what are we doing and where are we going? Because we're not getting there quick enough. But I love the fact that they pivoted at the end of every session they met and they shared with one another and said, this is working, here's what we can tweak based on the response that we've received from those that are on the steering committee. That meant a lot to me because when we met again, it could be the very next day we saw how they had pivoted. That lets me know they cared about what we were sharing. I'm a facilitator trainer by trade and coach. So for me to experience such great facilitation was utterly amazing. I've never seen anything like it, literally. And there's no other team that could have handled it the way the meal took care of it. And so with that being said, I went from feeling a little frustrated from time to time to understanding that this is going to happen. To use the verbiage of joy, it's not just about going here and saying this is where we are. It's about the long term. It's about saying we're here not to run a sprint, but to run a marathon. And it takes all of us collectively. So I'm really excited about the partnership we have with ODE. So here's our commitment as I get ready to close. I think about implementation through education and I think about the wonderful quote by Nelson Mandela, Mandela the most powerful tool we can use or the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world is education. So I'm really excited about being front and center, my team, organizational learning under CHR, to be able to move this forward beyond a document, but actually into something that's alive and that we all feel responsible to contribute to so that four years from now, we're having a much broader and bigger conversation and we look back at all that we've accomplished and say, you know what, yet there's still more to go. Thank you so much for listening, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Joseph and Ebony, for sharing. Um, it is so important that you all heard more than just from our office. We wanted you to hear the things that um, others felt while they were in the space over the last six months. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to now uh, invite, uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, I would like to invite two of our three work groups to the dais, uh, the Disability and LGBTQIA2 Plus work group. Um, and just to give a little context, if it is okay, I believe we will have a five minute recess after these two groups go. Is that, are we, is that okay? Or would you like us to just power through? No, we can have a five minute recess. Okay, so these two individuals um, that are on my team uh, will share along with others uh, that were part of their work group and then we'll take a five minute recess and then we'll re be rejoined with the managers of color at the dais. I will turn it over to the two of you. Good morning, chair and board of county commissioners. My name is Ashley Carroll, I use she and her pronouns, and I identify as a white cisgender woman with generally invisible mental health disabilities. I serve as a disability equity policy analyst senior in the Office of Diversity and Equity. The first iteration of the WIP, WESP missed inclusion of disabled staff and disability-centered recommendations. For this renewal, an explicit focus on disability-related needs was recognized and operationalized through the creation of the Disability Equity Work Group. Next slide, please. It was a great privilege to facilitate this work group. I got to work with seven employees with disabilities from diverse backgrounds, 
working throughout the county not only to do their day jobs, but also to engage in this imperative equity work. While the group has chosen to remain anonymous, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to each person whose input and lived experience contributed to this West renewal. The Disability Equity Workgroup met seven times from August to November. We began by reviewing multiple reports, including the Research on Equity and Accommodations for Employees with Disabilities report from 2019 and the ADA report that came out of the, the Health Department's Equity Leadership Program in 2021. Both of these reports focus primarily on the employee ADA accommodation process under the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. Recognizing that seven individuals cannot represent the diversity of disability experiences at the county, the group elected to disseminate a survey soliciting experiences and recommendations to improve the ADA accommodation process and overall disability equity work at the county. This survey received 218 responses, which is almost four times more than previous surveys engaging with disabled staff or staff with disabilities. This high response rate is likely due to the permission we got to utilize ADA case tracking information in Workday. We were able to invite all 285 staff with accommodation requests as entered into that database to participate. We valued each story and recommendation shared with us. Next slide. I'm going to hand the mic over to work group member Kristen Harbor to introduce herself and offer a few words. Hi everyone, I am Kristen Harbor. I use she, her pronouns. I identify as disabled and mixed heritage being both white and Latin A. Um, I am one of the co-chairs of the IDEA ERG and a union steward and executive board member of the union. Um, I'm also one of the seven members of the Disability Equity Work Group. This work group and the survey that we completed are so important because we know that there is so much ableism and anti-disability bias built into our systems and processes. And it's something we need to look at directly and intentionally as we make changes or we'll default back to the status quo, which is not accessible or intersectional. And until we make those changes, not only will be will we be failing to meet the needs of disabled staff, but also that staff will continue to feel unsafe to identify as having a disability, which I feel is really highlighted, as Ashley said, by the difference in the survey that we did compared to past disability surveys. This survey also highlighted the disparities for BIPOC staff for accommodation denials, which are really rare since those only happen when there's no possible accommodation that can be offered. Only 2% of accommodation requests for white staff were denied compared to 7% for black staff and 9% for Latin A staff. On the slide, you'll see the disability pride flag, which I would love to see be much more well-known than it is today. Uh, as a visual description, it is a gray square with, a, with green, blue, white, yellow, and red diagonal stripes. Those, stripe rep, those stripes represent various categories or types of disabilities, which really just highlights the expanse of disability. Uh, we also have a quote that a staff member included on the survey. They said, ADA standards are the floor, not a ceiling. And I just wanna come in and add, it's not just the floor, it's, it's the basement floor. I recently completed my ADA coordinator certification and something that stood out to me so much is how many of the standards don't offer much protection or support as we think that they do. Um, and honestly, it just, it, it felt so much more like it's about protecting the employer rather than supporting the employee. Uh, the quote continues, the county could lead and set the bar above and beyond ADA standards in the accommodation process because we believe and invest in our employees. And believe that is such an important piece of this because so often, whether it's in the accommodations process or just in day-to-day -day interactions, we encounter others questioning our needs and even our experiences. Uh, and that's why it's so necessary to include and center staff with disabilities, especially BIPOC staff with disabilities, as we move forward with these new initiatives. All right, I'll hand it back to Ashley. 
Thank you, Kristen, for your fierce advocacy throughout the county, your impactful leadership, and your passionate support, and the passionate support you provide employees. Next slide. And now we get into some of the final benchmarks. In this section, we quote a recommendation from an employee with a disability alongside a final benchmark and objective. Initiative one reads accountability. Make a required presentation to all staff and another specific to managers. Ensure that everyone has a chance to both learn about the ADA accommodation process and participate in regular feedback. It is important that all staff are aware and can help inform others. Benchmark 1.3 reads, develop awareness and knowledge of disability justice through consistent training on differentiating between visible and invisible disabilities, ableist language, and bias in the workplace, with the objective to increase countywide employee knowledge and to create a sense of belonging among employees with disabilities. Next slide. Infrastructure, or initiative number two is infrastructure. Make a one-stop shop for folks to view possible accommodations, apply for an accommodation, and receive guidance through the process for both employee and management. Benchmark two point, or for those who aren't familiar with the ADA accommodation process at Multnomah County, accommodations are facilitated by Department Human Resources. This decentralized model challenges our ability to provide staff with consistent experiences across departments and can stretch HR staff who may not regularly handle accommodation requests and who all have other programs in their portfolios. Benchmark 2.3, create a centralized accommodation unit within central HR to oversee the accommodation process with the objective to ensure countywide consistency and employee access to ADA accommodation. Next slide. Initiative four, training. Start with more information about accessibility and accommodations during onboarding. This could include managers or supervisors introducing what resources are available and how to initiate the process. Benchmark 4.3, implement a standardized county onboarding process to include employee rights for ADA accommodation with the objective to ensure employees understand how to engage leaders in requesting ADA accommodations. Next slide. Initiative four, data. Continued input from those with lived experience. We found such value in our survey results that we recommended creating a dedicated survey. Benchmark 5.1, implement a biannual disability experience survey with the objective to ensure staff with disabilities feel comfortable sharing their experiences without fear of retribution. An additional benchmark under the data category is 5.2, which reads, contract with external consultants to evaluate experiences for disabled employees, with the objective to ensure disabled staff experiences are caught through the lens of consultants with disability experience and supporting what is learned from internal surveys. Thank you for your time and attention today and as always, for the opportunity to participate in this integral work. I will now turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Sam Silverman. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Chair and Board of Commissioners. My name is Sam Silverman, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am an Asian American, pansexual, cisgender woman living with invisible disabilities. I work in the Office of Diversity and Equity as our Senior Equity Policy Analyst with a focus on LGBTQ plus inclusion. And I'm here to talk to you about the amazing work of the LGBTQIA 2S plus Workforce Equity Work Group that I had the great privilege of collaborating with over the course of the West Renewal. Before we begin, I'd like to share the story behind this quote so that we can ground ourselves in why this work is so important and why it must be intersectional to create real change. Marsha P. Johnson was a black trans woman famously credited with throwing the first brick at the Stonewall Inn riots in 1969, although she denied this claim. She was an advocate for trans rights and queer and trans people of color during a time when the gay rights movement overwhelmingly benefited white gay men and white lesbian women. Black trans women are victims of violence at a disproportionate rate to any other demographic group in America. Marsha was found dead in 1992 and the police did not investigate her murder. She was only 46 years old. So we look to her now as an icon of the LGBTQ plus community, and we use this quote as a charge for us to center our recommendations around the intersectionality of queer and trans identities, racial justice, and all other marginalized groups that are a part of our community. 
Across the county, there is a perception that race and gender are two separate issues that receive different amounts of time, attention, and resources. As we think about the West and other workforce disparities, it is critical for us to take an intersectional approach to what it means to improve the experiences of our employees, especially for our black trans staff. So we lead ourselves with the ideal that there can be no pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. Next slide, please. For some background about the group, the first iteration of the West did not mention gender or the unique needs of our transgender staff, despite the fact that Multnomah, uh, transphobia at Multnomah County is prevalent and the second most common form of discrimination reported to the Complaints Investigation Unit. There was some great work done to elevate the needs of our trans and gender diverse individuals through two reports commissioned in 2016 and 2017, but very little work was done to implement the recommendations in those reports, which has caused a lot of harm and frustration for our trans staff that are still experiencing harm in the workplace and out in the community. So for the West Renewal, we created the LGBTQIA 2S Plus Workforce Equity Workgroup to develop recommendations that would be specific to the needs of our trans and gender diverse staff. Next slide, please. Workgroup members were selected through an application process that was sent to the PRISM and Queering Trans People of Color Employee Resource Groups. It was really critical for us to ensure the diversity of this group, especially in a place like Multnomah County where the queering trans community is predominantly white. If we wanted to have an intersectional approach to gender justice, we needed to ensure we were centering trans people of color and other marginalized identities. The group comprised of nine staff members from across the county, 100% identify as transgender or gender diverse, 78% or seven out of nine identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. And all work group members brought a diverse array of lived experience with them that helped us consider other factors like age, disability status, family status, and more. Our work group members also elected to remain anonymous due to the sensitive nature of this work. So I wanna give them my endless gratitude for sharing their time, vulnerability, and emotional labor to elevate the trans community through the West. Next slide, please. The work group met every other week between September and November. Because work had been done already around gender inclusion at the county, rather than starting from scratch, we reviewed the reports from 2016, 2017, and a new one conducted by ODE in March of 2023. We had a design challenge to lead all of our conversations. How can we achieve gender justice in Multnomah County through inclusively leading with race? I wanna take a moment to thank Mary Lee and Ju Young Oh from the Multnomah Idea Lab because I modeled our working format after their amazing facilitation for the steering committee. Their trauma-informed and human-centered design helped us create a space that could feel safe and empowering for a community that has been historically silenced and that faces increasing hostility across the country, including here in Oregon. I could not have done this without their mentorship and I cannot thank you enough. Next slide, please. A lot of the work group's recommendations centered around accountability for staff that cause harm, creating support systems for our trans employees, and increasing the representation of BIPOC and trans and gender diverse staff across the organization. When I asked the group about prioritization for the recommendations, they stated very clearly that accountability and retention are the most important parts because we cannot retain our trans staff without having accountability. There's an environment of fear for our trans employees that are experiencing microaggressions and transphobia every day without seeing a meaningful response to protect them from harm. The West was guided by the phrase safety, trust, and belonging, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done for our trans staff to feel like this can be true for them too as they live and work here. Next slide, please. So here are some of the final benchmarks that came from the work group's recommendations. The group stated that the most critical recommendation is under the initiative for infrastructure, which is to develop a transgender, gender diverse committee represented by employees and allies with the ability to recommend, county recommend countywide policy, procedures, and training related to transphobia and gender equity. This would ensure that work related to the trans community is led by members of the trans community. Next is to ensure all central human resources benefit staff can demonstrate the knowledge and skills to create a seamless way for employees to access affordable gender affirming care. The objective is to ensure that staff within HR provide a safe and inclusive space for employees to be able to access this life-saving health care. Next slide, please. Under the initiative evaluation and policy, evaluate departmental programs and services to recruit and maintain staffing resources for LGBTQIA 2S plus individuals and people with disabilities. The goal of this recommendation is to identify where the county is serving the LGBTQ plus and disability communities and how we are recruiting and retaining staff from those communities to provide culturally responsive services. Next slide, please. Under the initiative for standard practice, demonstrate commitment to retaining employees that identify as transgender and gender diverse by streamlining processes for name and pronoun changes. 
Right now, these processes can be super complex and frustrating, so improving this experience should make it easier for us to affirm people's identities in the workplace. At the heart of it all, our goal is for trans and gender diverse people to feel safe, respected, and accepted in Multnomah County. I think about this quote from one of our work group members a lot as we move through this process. We deserve safety emotionally, physically, and psychologically. And this applies to all of our staff. One of the guiding principles <coughs> identified by the group was the need for intersectionality, recognizing that racism and homophobia are all fathered by one system of white supremacy. This is our call to action to fight alongside each other in pursuit of our collective healing and liberation. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak and to be a part of this incredibly meaningful work. I'll now pass it to Joy. Wow, um, I just wanna take a minute to pause because we heard from two incredible work groups. So first, I wanna say thank you to Ashley and to Sam for presenting as well as part of the work groups that presented uh, on screen, Christian. Kristen, and um, just the work group's dedication um, of their time. And I am so excited to see um, your group's inclusion in uh, this iteration of the WESP. It is truly a beautiful milestone, and I'm welcoming how this organization is going to be better for it. And to have, when we come back in four, the next time we come back to hear <laughs> the updates. Um, we'll now take a five minute recess, and then uh, we will be joined with the Managers of Color work group. Thank you. We stand in recess for five minutes.
Great, thank you everyone. I think that was modeling good practice to have a little break, um, appreciate it. And we will reconvene for the second half of the presentation on the rest renewal process. So Joy, I will turn it back over to you. Alrighty, well, welcome back everyone. And uh, right now, I would like to bring two representatives from the Managers of Color Work Group to share their details of the work. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Baker Peterson, uh, Commissioner Myron, Commissioner Brim Edwards, Commissioner Stegman, and I believe Commissioner Beeson uh, is online with us today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is good to be here uh, at this presentation of the County Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. Uh, we appreciate the work of our friend, colleague, and dear sister, Joy C. Fowler, and she told me what that C stands for, but I'm not going to tell nobody. I want to also appreciate the Deputy Director, Teresa Kelly, a friend and colleague of mine for over 35 years, and we appreciate the work, their efforts, their leadership, and their strategic visionary approach to this 2024 through 2028 Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. Although managers of color do not believe that the first iteration of the RESP included our needs uh, as an ERG and as a stakeholder group in this great county. We will continue to sound the alarm for managers of color for increased support, safety, trust, belonging, transparency from Multnomah County leadership at all levels. Next slide, please. Yeah. Myself, as one of two co-chairs for MOC, we convened a group of employees from our ERG to discuss racial equity challenges to continue to sound the alarm. Work group members included Alexis Alberti, Valdez Bravo, Jennifer Evans, Javelin Hardy, Samuel Johnson, Viju Kolodakudi, Charlene McGee, myself, and Katie Thornton. Next slide, please, and I'll pass to Tony Gaines. Hello. Uh Chair uh, Vega Peterson, um, Multnomah County Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tony Gaines. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm executive member of the Mo Managers of Color ERG. And I wanted to uh, talk to you about Initiative 2, the infrastructure uh, benchmarks um, for some of the things that uh, are in the West or will be in the West that Managers of Color have uh, sought to, to see added to the West. Um, specifically, the CIU process uh, and how it has been weaponized and used against managers of color. Um, that is something that we feel and we've heard many times has happened and taken place. And um, our end is to use the West as a tool to help resolve and address those issues. So benchmark 2.2, the evaluation of the complaint unit, investigation unit, CIU process, policies and outcomes. Uh, managers of colors have experienced weaponization during this process. We would like to see an evaluation of that specific unit, um, with the objective being to ensure employees have a func um, functional route for protected class complaints to be investigated in an equitable, consistent, and timely manner. Next slide. Thank you so much, Tony. For this next slide, Initiative 3, Retention. Uh, it calls for the analyzation of data from stay and exit interviews to understand the reasons managers of color are retained or leave at the county. We also want to acknowledge the work that's been done uh, in a previous exit interview with managers of color who are no longer with the county. Uh, that report is still a living document, and I believe we forwarded that report to some of the members uh, on the board today. And 
yes, we want to understand the reasons uh, why managers of color uh, are leaving because we believe that is immensely imperative with respect to our ability to be able to hire and attract uh, the most uh, uh, brilliant and intelligent, competent managers of color uh, to Multnomah County. The benchmark Department HR to complete annual comprehensive employee state interviews for a representative sample of employees countywide and provide a report with recommendations based on interview data analysis. What I would ask in benchmark 3.2 is that we not reinvent the wheel, but we use the existing processes, that we have used existing information uh, to at least determine uh, a baseline of where we are currently in the county and then establish a new structure and process as we move forward to continue uh, with uh, Department HR uh, to conduct uh, exit and state interviews. Our objective there, we want to contextualize the experience. Again, we say we want to contextualize the experience, but I believe we already have enough qualitative and quantitative data that tells us what the experience has been like to date for managers of color. So we agree with that objective. We support that ob objective uh, in terms of the outcome of somehow providing more investments and changing policies to, again, increase retention for managers of color. Benchmark 3.3, identify disparities in turnover rates of managers, identifying as black, indigenous, and people of color, uh, and identify strategies for rectifying the issues. And again, the objective there uh, is manager retention uh, to decrease turnover rate for black, indigenous, and managers of color. Next slide, please. Take the slide. That's it. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Tony Gaines, and he'll turn it back to me for final comments, and then we will yield our time back to Joy C. Fowler. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I just I come here as as a as, a, as I said as a as a representative for um, uh, managers of color ERG, um, and I come here to bring a message of hope, uh, appreciation, and caution. Um, regarding the plan and execution of the West, specifically as it relates to managers of color. Hope in that we are starting to see our way to a place where equity really exists here in the county. Uh, appreciation for the efforts of ODE, Joy and her team, um, the West work group members, uh, and others uh, that have brought us to this very point, including you, county commissioners. And caution that while we are moving in the right direction, as it relates to the WESP, MOC believes that we must keep going, keep working, because we are not yet at our arrival as it, as it relates to supporting and protecting those that are still most vulnerable while working in an environment that, is not, that has not always valued our lived experiences and contributions as people of color and as managers of color. Um, we have heard, uh, and I was a part of this group uh, at one point many years ago, uh, with a nod to Mary Lee over to my left. Um, we have heard that the ethos of the county is to be an organization that inclusively leads with race, which is great. But MOC would be remiss not to say that there are many leaders of color racing to get out of here. We can and must do better. The MOC executive team would like to take this time to encourage members of the Board of County Commissioners to attend the MOC meeting and listen to the stories of your people, your constituents, and engage with them in how we can continue to move the WESP and other ideas forward. Upon listening to these stories, uh, I think that you will find some of them very tough, but also very inspiring, um, and that it will cause you to uh, act in all the ways in which you can and with the power that you hold to continue to ensure that people of color, managers of color, experience uh, a, a work environment that supports and appreciates them. We support the WESP speaking to and supporting the needs of our LGBTQIA2S plus friends and coworkers, as it should. We support the WESP speaking to and supporting the needs of those representing the ADA community as it should, and we wholeheartedly support the West addressing the needs of manager, managers of color, as it should. 
MOC acknowledges that the WESP is trending in the right direction while also highlighting that it has not yet reached its intended destination. We applaud Joy Fowler and ODE for their leadership and for working to create an outline uh, of what equity should look like in the county. It has no doubt been an arduous task, uh, or as Joy stated, this process is, has and remains to be a heavy lift. Um, and I think it's one that will have a huge payoff if the execution of this WESP is done effectively. And Joy, you better be here until perpetuity. <laughs> Unless you be clear on that. Um, I wanna thank Travis Brown and Serena Cruz for having conversations with MOC executive team regarding the needs of managers of colors. And those are conversations we hope will continue. And lastly, I will just say that um, equity is messy. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I just mean that there's no straight line to get us there. But I'm thankful to see the progress in this WESP, and I'm appreciative of the contributions to those seen and unseen um, that have gotten us to this point. Thank you. And I'll say to end, you know, there has been a lot of discussion uh, with MOC going back to June of 2023. I want to thank Madi. Uh, who and others an ODE who sent the capture notes to the West Committee renewal members. Uh, let me, I think I said my name, but I am here as co-chair of MOC. Uh, and I was also a committee member for the West renewal process. And as we gathered information from the capture notes, not all members were able to give us feedback in writing, but through our MOC meetings that we had monthly, it became clear to the MOC leadership that a great majority of those MOC members engaged did not agree with the WESP, although it was headed in the right direction. Chair, you said something in your opening remarks that actually made me happy. Because as we know around this country, in the United States of America, in private organizations, private corporations, and even with respect to our neighbors from the East, DEI is beginning to phase out. And not just DEI departments, but leaders of those departments are given pink slips and asked to leave because of the sentiment and mood in this country. So Chair, for you to make those statements, those remarks, those articulations, and the investment in this WESP spoke volumes to MOC. Joy, your comments that this is not a destination, it's a journey. The comments that speak to the fact that there is more work to do. I'm looking forward to the debrief sessions where we can actually sit down and have conversation, very strategic and intentional conversations about how we can further advance the causes, how we can further advance the agenda of managers of color. As you've heard me say before to this August body, not only do we face and encounter racism, discrimination, microaggression, microassaults, systemic oppression, institutional racism, because of the nature of the jobs we have, we also lead and try to resolve those same issues that we encounter every day. I sit here on behalf of the managers of color who are afraid to come because they have to pay bills. Their kids are in college. They are afraid to lose their job. And this is why I'm hopeful today for a better future and I look forward to having the discussions because as it was said today, this is the start of a conversation and I would say a very important conversation. I came to the county in 2015, left because of racism and discrimination, came back in 2020. Do I feel the same today in 2020 that I did in 2015? I sure do. But because of your statements, Chair, and because of the leader of ODE, Joy Fowler, I'm hopeful that the conversation will continue and drill down more and more 
so that we can ensure managers of color experience the same safety, trust, and belonging as everyone else in this county. Thank you so much for listening. We yield back to Joy C. Fowler. Use my whole government name. Good. Uh, <laughs> um, well, first, before you before you um, go, I do want to say, um, you know, I, I am also a manager of color, and I take to heart what I heard you say, what I hear you say, and what I know you all will continue to say. And one of the things I want to do, which other groups have gotten this, and I pulled this together for both of you, is I want you to leave with. Um, the recommendations that um, only because as I was looking through this in the wee hours I saw that um, I wanted to see a little bit more reflected so I wanted you all as you prepare to go back to managers of color with not only my support but the support of ODE all of the benchmarks that are reflected in here that you all not only presented um, in October of 2023 to the work group but I want you to know I heard you back in 2022 when I got here and I was listening and I tend to be very goal oriented and probably a little bit too structured. So I like to mark things off of my list and when they don't get marked off of my list, I put them in a placeholder so that I know I can think about them as we move forward. So I also looked back to see did we actually think of, did, was there some inclusion of, of our benchmarks from that time in this? And so I leave you with this. No, they are not exactly what you, because you know, we couldn't take all the words, <laughs> but um, there, are, there is some reflection in there. So I wanted you to have that as a personal commitment from myself and from the Office of Diversity and Equity. The other work groups already have theirs, but I felt that it was important that you got this presented to you today. So with that, I thank you, I appreciate you both, and always looking forward to the continued uh, conversation no matter what time it is. <laughs> Don't, <laughs> thanks, Joy. <Sean. laughs> and now I would like to, um, have uh, Alejandro and Mari rejoin me uh, for some final pieces of the presentation. And we'll start with, I believe, Ale. Okay, so um, the next uh, section of, of our presentation, we're gonna actually go through um, the phases and uh, the, bench, the benchmarks that we identified for the next four years. But before we do that, I wanted to give um, some context of the overall overarching um, benchmark things that came from the process. Um, one of the biggest uh, conversations that we had throughout the process was um, the need to collaborate between um, departmental HR and central HR and equity teams. Um, as you all know, uh, Multnomah County operates in a decentralized HR model where we have, um, I, I believe, 11 um, separate HR units, um, which presents a challenge when we're trying to coordinate across the organization um, within our, to accomplish our equity efforts. One of the goals for implementation is to ensure that we um, create processes so that it Im invites collaboration between these departments so that we are not just uh, duplicating our work, uh, but that we're all aligned um, over the next four years. We're also, um, uh, one of the uh, issues that came up um, throughout the process as well was the issue of like consistent funding. Um, the previous West did not have a funding vehicle attached to it, and so a lot of the recommendations that came from it were unfunded mandates. So it really took almost the entire the seven years of, the, of implementing the previous West to actually build out the infrastructure so that we can actually um, meet the benchmarks um, for that plan. What we are um, um, intending to do this time around is to tie the implementation process to our budget process to, one, um, provide uh, more intentional funding um, and conversation, but also accountability as there'll be more intentional reporting from uh, every department um, equity team and HR unit. We're also um, going to uh, establish more evaluations and reporting that, are, that describe what the issues are within the county, uh, the workforce equity issues um, that we are dealing with within the county. Um, and we're creating a data gov uh, consortium that is gonna uh, be a subcommittee of our West Implementation Committee that will allow us to um, really build out some um, data gathering um, and evaluation infrastructure that is sorely needed within the organization. And then we are also um, to address the diversifying um, workforce. We're also um, going to increase our specific employee supports and services. 
Um, and then finally, one of the biggest themes that came out from our process was um, addressing anti-black bias across the, the county. So despite um, our um, diversifying efforts, despite the fact that we have more black employees um, in, in this county than we have ever had, we are still seeing a large disparity in voluntary separations for both um, black managers and represented staff. And so when, with our implementation plan, we are going to explicitly and intentionally um, look for th those disparities so that we can um, intentionally uh, resolve them. And then um, hand them over to, I think, me. Oh. <laughs> All righty, next slide, please. Um, so we think it really is important for everyone to get a look at the benchmarks and accompanying initiatives. Um, they are intentionally condensed here, so we are not providing an immense amount of slides, um, but the full descriptions of all the benchmarks, including the performance measures, can be found uh, on the board report um, included in your board packet. Um, they are being presented in phases, and each phase re represents a fiscal year, for example, from 2024, 2025, 2025 to 2026, and so on. So just before we dive right in, um, and we'll run through this as quickly as possible, why the phased approach? Um, the previous WESP did not provide a plan for what was to get done and when. With our partners seeing what we're looking to achieve each year, it really helps them do the following, assess their department. Um, based on that assessment, determine what is feasible, if they require resources, and do they even have the capacity to do what is needed. Um, then uh, select benchmarks that work for their department, and then follow from there, uh, make progress over the course of the four years, as opposed to feeling like they have to accomplish everything all at once. A lot of times when you see things just thrown out there, it can be a little bit overwhelming, and so we wanted to take that um, overwhelming aspect away and then really to solidify um, this enterprise-wide approach we're tying this to our budget process which you heard Alejandro speak about earlier so I'll review phase one Alejandro will review phases two and three and then Mariana will review phase four so this first slide um, just to do a really high-level overview um, here you see benchmarks around creating uh, implementation infrastructure to support the West by establishing committees um, then you'll see executing a series of evaluations related to the complaint investigation unit, and then last but definitely not least, creating a data consortium for data collection and analysis. Next slide. Continued in phase one, you'll have support for the WESP infrastructure by establishing committees for the WESP implementation, um, and then reviewing the conflict resolution services from our 2022 analysis. Then focusing on retention, which is around implementing countywide stay interviews for uh, managers with a focus on managers of color. Next slide. Then you will have uh, continuing with retention for the, within this first year, uh, having countywide stay interviews for employees, followed by assessing the needs of our community uh, contracts to lead culturally specific trainings, and then a focus on disability experience through a survey to align with the countywide engagement survey. Next slide. And then to round out year one or phase one, evaluating our practices and policies regarding wellness benefits, gender inclusivity, and our commitment to transgender and gender diverse employees. And I'll now turn it over to Ale, who will review phases two and three. Thank you. So um, after our initial efforts in phase one to create the implementation infrastructure, we'll be, a be able to um, begin creating new infrastructure and addressing some of the recommendations that require more um, research and thought uh, and process. So um, kicking off, one of the um, benchmarks that um, we're hoping to achieve is to ensure the status of ADA accommodations um, by uh, one, uh, by sorry, uh, supported by regular communication, but then also to um, begin the conversations of establishing an ADA accommodations um, unit or infrastructure um, to centralize accommodations. We'll develop um, awareness and knowledge of disability justice through consistent training and include that into our curriculums with, um, within organizational learning and ODE. Um, we'll create a charter for the Protected Class Committee, which is the committee that um, oversees the Complaints Investigations Unit um, to outline the roles and responsibilities of all of the committee members. We will also in incorporate training for HR teams related to anti-bias and targeted questions around anti-bias um, for HR candidates um, during, the, during our interview process when we're um, recruiting um, HR um, positions. 
Next slide. Okay. We'll create a centralized accommodations unit within central HR to oversee the accommodations process. Um, we'll discuss the feasibility of transferring uh, staff from organizational learning to ODE to help us assess the, um, to help us com um, accomplish some training um, benchmarks um, outlined in, throughout the plan. And then we'll also identify disparities in turnover rates of managers identifying as a black, indigenous, and people of color, and identify strategies to recti um, rectify those issues regarding retention. Um, next slide, please. We'll also um, develop a comprehensive catalog of black and indigenous and people of color retention strategies to uh, address um, the disparities in um, voluntary, voluntary separations. And we'll also um, uh, begin a collaboration between ODE and organizational learning to develop a centralized countywide mandatory baseline equity training. We'll also implement a standardized countywide onboarding process to include uh, employee rights for ADA accommodations. Next slide, please. And then by year three, um, this is where we will essentially uh, um, have our process evaluation. So we will look at the past two years um, and um, check wh how we're doing um, and pr produce a, a process evaluation in addition to our annual report or in our annual report for that year. Um, we'll develop a workforce equity uh, strategic plan implementation committee. Oh, wait, 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 that's year three. Hmm. Uh, oh, that's like the sorry. first one. That, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, we'll ensure as, as all central HR benefit staff um, can create a seamless way for employees to access affordable gender affirming care. We'll evaluate the barriers for employees to participate in employee resource groups and other countywide opportunities. Next slide, please. And um, each, we'll, each department will um, implement and enhance their employee onboarding experience by by integrating equity topics and ensuring that we have equity um, frameworks included. And we'll contract with external consultants with experiences with people with disabilities to evaluate their experiences um, and provide external perspectives on our organizational progress regarding disabilities. And then we'll review equity positions to assess the need for a separate classification to conduct an, and conduct an organizational analysis on equity roles. So um, it, exploring the idea of creating a specific equity um, classification separate from um, HR classifications, which we all currently are in. Um, and that's it. That's the, yeah, oh, that's it. All right, now I'll pass it over to Mariana. Thank you. Um, I'll be sharing it briefly, uh, phase four, um, our last phase, but certainly not least. Um, here you see benchmarks around enhancing employee trial service by using the feedback from the new, empl new employee hire survey to ensure employees receive the tools, information, and guidance to pass their trial service period. Um, we will also see implement implementing exclusive identity data collection practices that reflect multiracial identities within the workforce, and all this position descriptions will be updated to reflect current um, essential job functions. Also during phase four, um, it's the, the shorter um, list of the implementation. Um, uh, we'll also be embarking on the next uh, renewal process for the next plan. Um, very exciting. We're already looking at four <laughs> years ahead. But just wanted to note that, uh, which you see, the, uh, we'll also be doing that work um, alongside uh, phase four of the implementation plan. Um, yeah, short uh, slide. Um, next, I'll pass it on to Joy to close us out. Alrighty, so just always keep in mind what is a strategic plan, not static and not unchanging. So this is the plan, but we recognize uh, that some may want to do things earlier or push things out. That's the beauty of a plan. It's flexible, it's pivotable, and it really can just go with how we see the needs of the organization. So I just want to be have you all be mindful of that as we close out you seeing um, all four of the phases. To say I am proud of what we have accomplished over these last eight months is really an understatement. At times, there were so many moving parts, West meetings, onboarding of participants, pivoting to engage participants, writing captures, sharing out captures, so surveying those not in meetings, incorporating those um, thoughts into the West renewal. I could literally go on and on. And to all of you, we made it look, I will say, the Office of Diversity and Equity made it look quite easy. Um, and I'm proud of that because they did it uh, seamlessly which is the way it is supposed to work. 
Uh, once each of you um, sitting at the dais take the opportunity to vote, here's when the real work begins. Collaboration and implementation, commitment and implementation, coordination and implementation. Keyword, implementation. We want the county to be actionable, accountable, and own this strategic plan so in four years when we are engaging, so in four years we are engaging and moving differently while measuring our progress as one county. Thank you all so very much. And now uh, we'll move to the next slide and open it up. Thank you. So um, really appreciate all the incredible um, work that went into this and all the incredible um, words that we've heard today. Um, I do believe we have a couple of public testimony on that, so I'm gonna ask you to step um, back for a second. Mm -hmm. We'll do the public testimony and then we will um, have the board share questions and comments. I'm just moving my screen here, just one second. Uh, we have two public testimonies. Uh, one is virtual, Elena Wilson. Um, and I believe this might be her. Hi, El Elena, um, I can't see your name. Are you able to unmute and speak? Yeah, I think I'm not seeing Elena. Uh, next testimony is Jared Essig. Good morning, Chair Peterson, Commissioner, citizens of Multnomah County, and um, leaders of the um, Office of uh, Equity and Inclusion. Thank you for your report. Uh, we are here in the city of Greater Willamette. You might not know that. Um, on the east side of the Multnomah River. Um, I think there should be a land acknowledgement and uh, I'm disappointed that there was not more inclusion of indigenous persons in this uh, report. Um, Oregon also has a long history of anti-Asian bias starting even before the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s. Um, one of the reasons Japanese were allowed to come was because Chinese were excluded and before that, they were allowed to, you know, build the railroads and work in the canneries and clear land, but they weren't allowed to own land or get married or pass on their property to their children. Um, the way that anti-Asian bias ex manifests in society now is through um, the expectation that they'll convert, assimilate to white supremacism. And out of the half a dozen Chinese churches in America that I've met, that I've visited, I I'll even tell, even the pastors themselves, the Chinese people will admit to me, you know what, I'm more white than you are. I've heard that from several Chinese Americans. That was my case, that was my experience in college as well. Someone said that in order to deal with anti-blackness, we have to acknowledge the superior complex enabled by white supremacism and begin to dismantle it. And that's something that a white person or white passing person like myself has to lead on. Now, you have to distinguish the fact of, of political and financial white supremacy from the ideology that's of white supremacism, which says that this was a, this supremacy was obtained through genetic superiority, which I deny and denounce. Let me tell you how white supremacy was obtained. It was obtained through a massive fraud. It was also obtained through our continuing the legacy of the Roman Empire. Um, America, <laughs> neither the Oregon Territory nor the Massachusetts Territory is the promised land, all right? And neither Roman Catholics nor white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are the chosen people. And we need to admit that. This is why I successfully petitioned to remove the, quote, promised land statue from the Chapman Square in 2020. Uh, and that was the only statue that was removed by the rack and not by a mob. And I did s distributed the petition because unless you, unless you, unless the government decides to take it down, unless the, we really understand that, it's just going to go right back up. Nevertheless, I want that history to be remembered because this is our history. It was obtained. What the 1862 uh, Homestead Act? I think Commissioner Beeson mentioned this a couple weeks ago. This was the biggest affirmative action program in the history of America. The biggest. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, entitlement program in America. 
That's why the Palestine issue is so near and dear to the hearts of so many post-Christian progressive liberals, is it now, and, and that's why anti-Jewish bias is at the basis of it too. Now, that's why the Middle East peace plan intersects with overcoming white supremacism and anti-Asian Is your mic on? Uh, Elena, uh, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin public testimony. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Commissioner. My name is Elena Wilson, and I work for the Sheriff's Office as an equity analyst. I identify as black, and I serve on the executive board for managers of color. I'm here to echo the comments made by my colleagues during their presentation. Managers of color recognize the need for a workforce equity strategic plan that not only speaks of the concerns of managers of color, but specifically represents the needs of managers of color. Managers of color continue to experience numerous hardships that include racism and discrimination in our everyday work and well-being, making the county a challenging and at times traumatic environment to work in. Uh, the managers of color ERG feels the West is trending in a positive direction. While it does include some of the unique concerns of managers of color, such as the recommendation to analyze data from state and exit interviews to understand the reasons managers of color are retained or leave the county. There are still areas that need to be addressed to ensure inclusivity for MOC. Managers of color call for the need of a branch in the West that specifically speaks to at least the following things. A codified plan implemented to address microaggressions against all marginalized and vulnerable groups with a specific focus on people of color. An actionable plan to retain supervisor and man management level staff that identify as people of color. Our goal as representatives of the Managers of Color ERG is to illustrate the many challenges we continue to face as people of color as we seek to lead in an organization that does not consistently value our unique lived experiences and contributions. In an effort to ensure that our needs are fully met and accurately depicted in the WESP, we will continue to work with and press upon the Office of Diversity and Equity, Central Human Resources, Labor Relations, and other departments and stakeholders to this end. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to your continued support. That is all the public testimony. Thank you, Marina. All right, um, we will now go to the board for questions and comments. So, Joy, if you want to come back up with um, some of your folks, we'll um, turn it over. We'll start with um, Commissioner Myron, and we have about um, four minutes per person if we want to have time for board comment. I'll try. Um, I, I would hope we could potentially go over because this is such an important issue that if our comments go over that we could accommodate that um, but I'll see where they end up um, so thank you so much joy and your team for the presentation here today and all the work that you have done that you have put into getting us this far um, joy I do echo all the praise that you have received today I have found you to be so um, direct and responsive and, uh, you know, a central place. I, I know where to go. Unlike so many things at the county, I'm like, if I have a question about this, I know who to go to and I will get what I need. So that means a lot. Thank you. Um, you know, workforce, it, this sounds so trite, but it's, it's so true that workforce equity is foundational to our organization. It is the heart of our organization. It should be. Um, so many of our employees have been traumatized over so many years, and we as an employer, as an organization, um, need to be walking our talk. Some of what I heard just in the introduction of the West, I wanted to um, acknowledge it because it 
It struck me in describing it, said the WESP started a, a year before the pandemic and continued on during the pandemic. And I recall those days very clearly. The process started in, I think it was 2017, maybe two, early 2018. Um, there's been 50 to $100 million, I think, of investment when you get right down to it in this process. And it stopped during the pandemic. Um, it was a problem because we used the pandemic as an excuse to say, oh, we can't have these conversations around equity. So we have learned from the pandemic. We have learned what we need to do. Um, but I feel like if we are reflecting on history as a foundation on which to build, that we need to acknowledge some of the the reality of that and perhaps the depth of some of our failures rather than glossing over them or else it just kind of sets a false stage for where we are today. But that is something to think about but not dwell on. And moving on to the now, I just deeply appreciated Ebony, your description of the process and what it took to participate in that steering committee. You're, I don't know where I'm like looking, but. It's over there. There you are, oh, because you're like way over there. Just your description of um, what you experienced and going home at night and what you felt and how profound that experience was for you was really, um, really powerful and I appreciate your sharing it here today. Um, I, Joseph, what I really appreciate you, your description of your process and going from that kind of skepticism to having your needs, like seeing what you needed to see and hearing what you needed to hear and experiencing that. That really was meaningful and I appreciate it. Um, and the great facilitation over there, I see you, Mary, of, of the mill and all the work there. Um, Sam, just calling out that wherever you, I'm like in my reading glass, I don't know. Um, the, that, uh, pr the intersectional approach that you just highlighted, um, whether it's to transgender justice, um, but all, all that we do. And, you know, next Thursday, in partnership with PRISM and QTPOC, I will be bringing forward the Transgender Day of Visibility Proclamation before the board. And each year we bring that proclamation forward, we hear about the need to walk our talk. No more empty promises. It's our responsibility to show progress into what we have committed to improving. And there is progress here that I see. I am really, um, excited about that. I see infrastructure that previously did not exist. I see equity managers in all our departments. I see some centralization, uh, and I think we need m significantly more of that. And I see accountable leadership. And this did not exist prior to you coming to the county, frankly, Joy. Um, I still, don't necessarily see the connection or translation of the work on the front line for all employees, including managers of color. I see employees still telling me deep, 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 deep off record because they are so in fear that they feel a toxic culture and are still suffering, that the processes don't necessarily work for them. I think the key is having that safe space and deep, meaningful engagement of all of our employees. You know, 30 on the steering committee is great, but that is not all of our employees. How we show up in these things, even presentations to the board, are they're biased by definite, like you can't have that experience. So I mean, I would be interested in seeing maybe the minutes from, or whatever it's possible to see from the, the ERG um, facilitations and listening sessions, and we should expand on that, in my view, and just do that in depth, whatever, however, wherever we can. And we should not do it at the last minute, like on the last day of February, two weeks, less than two weeks ago. Um, we should be doing it from the beginning and involving our employees foundationally. Commissioner Meyer, your time's almost up. Um, 
and I would request some grace to be able to continue. It might be three more, three extra minutes. So it's, you're at six minutes and 30 seconds now. Okay, three extra minutes then. But thank you. I will I just feel it's important to call people out and the things that they're doing. Anyway, so, and Dr. Richard and Tony Gaines, um, with managers of color, thank you for your words. We as a board have heard from you for two years, very specific recommendations, clear requests. I believe we've made promises to you and the ODE has made promises to you and the WESP to have a branch to really incorporate what you have recommended. And um, Tony, I think you really described it well. I love the message of hope, appreciation and caution. The hope is there, appreciation for those who have gotten us to us po this point, and caution because we're not there. It's a heavy lift, and a lot of your words stuck with me. Um, and finally, investment. This is not about the money, but our investments matter. Last year alone, it was a $14 million investment in this process with 60 FTE. Since 2018, that's why I say it's at least 50 to 100 million dollars of investment in a very decentralized way where there hasn't been accountability. So it's not about the money, but we need to be getting what we're paying for. And so that gets us back full circle to action and results. The WESP, yeah, there's some words on the paper here. It's a written plan, but the key is the heart and that it's a living document, and I so appreciate the chair and um, Joy and all of you for sort of acknowledging that because I wouldn't, if this was just the plan, I would not be able to approve it. But because it is living and I know there is potential for change, I feel confident with your leadership um, in perpetuity that we will, we will see the changes we need to see. And um, so I, I really thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. You're mixing it up today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all. I'm, I'm not going to address you one, each one individually, but know that I have heard and listened uh, and, and, and feel what has been shared with this board today. And uh, I think back to my time when I started on the board in 2017 and met with the managers of color, uh, many of our ERGs, and this plan began far before 2017, like maybe 20 years before 2017. And I remember uh, questioning uh, the groups that I met with, like, why is this taking so long? Uh, which uh, there were a multitude of, of responses, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that there are people that are in this room who have carried this forward, and there are probably more people that are not in this room. Uh, that, that you all, we all stand on their shoulders because of their courage, their tenacity, uh, and their determination. Uh, and, you know, I, I joy, like you said, is that I, I would argue, you know, we're talking about this being a journey versus a destination. I would, I would say it's both. Uh, and that uh, we would not be here if we weren't still striving for that destination. Uh, so, you know, thank you so much to the work groups. I, I mean, I think in the plan, I love how you've phased it out, you've chunked it out. I mean, it goes back to, you know, how, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one, one, one bite at a time. And like, the, the, this, there's so much work to be done. And usually when you, when you hear the world word, uh, uh, institutional, it's usually not in a positive way. <laughs> However, uh, today I think that we can talk about institutionalizing some practices uh, that are positive, and that's the work, Joy, that, that you and your team and all of the work groups have been aspiring to. You know, the, uh, all of the initiatives uh, are, you know, I mean, you just can't, it, it's so important to have a plan and a document and strategies and actions, but at the end of the day, 
is the heart and the soul and the sacrifices that you all make, that we all make as people of color to engage with our counterparts who may not understand the challenge. And we're not, you know, we're not all the same, right? Asian, there's a lot of different <laughs> ethnicities uh, in the API community. There's a lot of ethnicities in the black community, on and on and on. And the fact that we are able to recognize uh, our individualities, our strengths and our weaknesses and the intersectionality of all of those things makes me really proud and makes me really happy. We have a long ways to go, but uh, I'm confident with you all, we're getting there. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Commissioner Brim Edwards. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanna start by thanking um, everybody in this room um, who helped co-create um, this plan. Co-creation is really a powerful way to work. Um, and I think that's reflected in what I, why I see in the plan. And I'm also, um, I love the descriptive words that were used here. Um, implementation, actionable, accountable, and um, I think with the, it was uh, not static, but I guess the, other, the converse would be dynamic. Um, and I think that's really important for it to be successful because um, moving forward, I think you know, through pressure testing and what, um, how it's implemented, there'll be learnings that need to be incorporated. Um, I also want to say that um, I feel like somewhat I'm coming in midstream to um, the Mul Multnomah County specific journey. And so I'm just in a different place than um, lots of other people in the room. So every, um, everybody has an individual journey that um, travels along with the, the larger um, group journey. Um, and since I've only been sitting um, in this seat for less than um, 10 months, um, so my journey, that's when my journey started, my really, with Multnomah County. Um, and it started as I was sitting out, out in the audience um, looking at the data relating to, um, the disparate data relating to hiring, retention, and promotions for um, our employees. And it, it told a, a story um, of work that needs to be done. Um, and while I haven't been on the Multnomah County journey for the, in this seat um, for, um, along with everybody else. Um, I do have a long history with other large public institutions in Portland, and I know that institutional racism and anti-blackness has been embedded in our public institutions in this community for a long time, and that progress has been made, and there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so I'm gonna be really interested and wanna be engaged in the journey going forward. Um, I have some, since this is also time for questions, I have, I have some questions and just some re requests just so I can understand. We had a chance to talk about this um, prior to the meeting, um, but as I, as I look through um, both the presentation and then the report, um, it, one thing I just naturally always do is looking for really specific um, like SMART goals in terms of like things we're gonna measure and um, the document is less, um, it's not so much set up like that in terms of having really specific, like here's, here's what we wanna have done by your, like year, year one and how we're gonna measure really specific baseline data. So I'm wondering if you could just briefly share like how that process will work. Um, so if we're going to be actionable and accountable, what, how are those specific goals and targets going to be set and where would we find them and how would they be reported on? Absolutely, and so, you know, I never profess to do anything alone, and so I predict that coming up behind me, if they have not started making their way, is Dr. Ronnie Cano from the Office of Diversity and Equity, and so I would love to turn it over to her to be able to share exactly uh, the response to your question. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair. Good, Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Dr. Veronica Cano, Ronnie Cano, and um, I'm the Research and Evaluation Analyst Senior for the Office of Diversity and Equity. So um, yes is my response to your question, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Edwards. We are actually intentionally excluding at this moment the metrics, the numbers that you're looking for. And the reason for that is because the entire WESP uh, initiative, so to speak, is requiring the collaboration between all our departments and data that is coming from our departments. 
and what the initial WESP did not have and was not built in was this process, this infrastructure to be able to tap into every department, capture the same data, make sure we're measuring apples to apples as we elevate this up into addressing whether these performance measures were actually met or not. And the absence of that did not allow myself, when I was here about a year ago with Alejandro presenting on the process evaluation of the first iteration of the WESP, it did not allow me to speak to the outcomes. What was achievable? What did we achieve? Other than we created a CIU, but we couldn't tell you whether any of these measures actually had an impact. And so with that in mind, we wanted to focus on creating these benchmarks, the performance measures that tell us what the process of data collection is going to look like. The data consortium, which is going to be made up of representatives from every department, is going to come together and develop those metrics. A lot of our data lives in Workday, but before it's entered in Workday, it has to actually be defined sometimes by department, departmental HRs, for instance, training data. Uh, our staff are required to enter training hours. However, how training is operationalized or defined differs depending on the departmental HR, not to mention that we don't necessarily track and ensure that that data is being entered. Training hours are important for us to be able to assess professional development and how that professional development is being, is being displayed out by race, ethnicity, or gender identity, et cetera. And so point being, and I'll summarize, that the data consortium will be the group that's going to come together and determine what metrics need to be attached to each performance measure, whether that metric is achievable now with data collection strategies or if we have to create those strategies, um, and basically streamline this process across the county so we are having a county-wide evaluation. While that data will also help departments create their own strategic plans and evaluate their own internal efforts of equity. Great. So I'd, I'd like to make a request that when that happens, so I appreciate the, the answer that um, the um, information be shared with the commission so we have an understanding of um, what those targets are, what the baseline data is, so that we can, again, see what sort of adjustments and as we're going through the budget process, um, like how that might inform our budget. Um, I have a couple things, but additional things that I'd like to ask for. There is a slide on promotion and professional development um, that shows sort of a narrowing of the gap. I'd love to get offline um, more data because it's um, fairly high level. I'm not sure I understand specifically the difference between the promotion and professional developments is one thing. The other thing, um, I in, in slide 11, um, it's talking about the committee and it references the union and I'm wondering what um, union representatives were included and what the plans are for union engagement, um, not just represented employee, but actually the, the union leaders um, in the implementation. Do you all want to speak to that or do you want me to speak? So um, I just, we did have, uh, well, she identified herself as a union steward, which was part of the one of the work groups. Uh, we also had uh, Jackie Tate involved in our, um, on the workforce, the West Steering Committee. And um, even when uh, Jackie had to depart to go work uh, in another role, which was congratulations to her, we worked to ensure, um, you heard us talk a little bit about pivoting. Um, so what we did was when we identified that we were either losing people because two full days was a lot, we worked with the mill to shift our perspective and we held uh, town halls, and that allowed for more uh, represented union individuals to participate in that aspect. And I can, we're more than happy to get you the actual metrics if you would like them. And what about for the implementation? Oh, well, you want to talk about implementation? Um, sure. So in preparation for our, our board briefing, we also met with AFSCME Local 88 and Jackie, who is now the president, and we discussed um, having uh, them, them or a representative from AFSCME sit on our implementation committee um, throughout the process. Great. And then um, I have some other questions I'll send to you. My, just my last okay. one is um, on their initiatives overview, it's focused on retention and I'm curious that, that initiative three and I'm curious about the sort of hiring and promotion which are sort of the two other sort of big pieces um, is the focus um, solely on, ret on retention um, I know that's an important thing but also as is you know um, having um, 
mm -hmm. more diverse, uh, diverse um, hiring and also promotion. So I'm curious about uh, the focus on retention. It, it's important, and, it's, and I'm wondering if it's an and or that's what we really want to focus on because that's where our biggest um, opportunities are. Mm -hmm. So it is an and, and so what we did in the report was we discussed um, things that would carry over from the previous West because the objective is not that the things from the first West would just fall and we wouldn't utilize anything. So we have everything from our C to C interns. Those will still carry over. We have also things related to hiring uh, from the first West that will all carry over as well. So we uh, there is a section, I'm not sure of the page, but we can get you the page. But in there we talk about the importance of the things that were in, ingrained in the first West that they will be carried on. So it, this is in addition to um, the First West, Thank which you. had hiring included. Appreciate it, and I'll yeah. submit the rest of my questions. Yeah, absolutely. Just appreciation to everybody in this room who contributed to the work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beeson. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all for all this incredible amount of work. Um, we know that our country has uh, baked racism in through our public policy, public resources, and public practices, and inside government is uh, has not been immune to that. Uh, I recognize that um, there's a lot of work that went into this and a lot of work yet to be done, and just want to show great appreciation for us uh, not running away um, from uh, the problems that we face, and also recognize that uh, it took many years to get us here. Uh, it will take some time uh, to uh, unwind uh, these public policies, practices, and behaviors uh, that we have as a county. Um, I look forward to uh, watching the implementation happen and just uh, express great appreciation for the many, many um, hours, uh, many, many people, um, and many, many conversations that went into the WESP. Thank you all. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Beeson. Um, I really appreciate the all of the work that went into this. I really appreciate this presentation. I think this was really, um, really well done. So thank you for all the work that went into this. Um, I, I um, giving voice to all of the work that happened, really highlighting um, the voices of those who weren't included in the first version of the WESP and having those work groups. Um, was really powerful, so I just appreciate everybody who's here and who spoke from those work groups to, to share um, um, and highlight and be able to focus on the work that is needed in those areas um, and um, all, of the, all of the pieces that went together to, to really give us this path going forward. Um, and it really, you know, to me, it is a path. Like it's, it's a, and we're gonna, we're gonna learn, we're gonna grow, we're gonna make mistakes, and, and you know, and like fix things, and, um, and, and you know, strive to be inclusive because there's a lot of work to do. I mean, there's, there, we're dedicated and committed to this, and um, I thank you, Dr. Richards, from acknowledging that it, because I am so committed to this work, and, and we're gonna see this um, happen, but we're. You know, when we think about, and Commissioner Beeson re referenced this, when you think about, you know, racism in this country or racism in this county, you know, it's a feature, not a bug, right? Like that was how our systems are set up. And now we have to do this intentional work to, to change that. And this is a piece of that um, because we have the power up here to, to change these systems, to change the way that this government works, but we cannot do that without the participation of all of you, your voices, your perspectives, your experiences, your wisdom, um, and really making yourself vulnerable and sharing things as we heard folks do today, um, and I know people did throughout this whole process. So I just wanna appreciate that. I wanna appreciate the, the work that people are taking on um, to do this, um, but it is all for the greater good of all of us and really um, make sure that we at Multnomah County can be creating a place of safety and trust and belonging, that we are living by our values of inclusive living with race. Um, and so this was a really um, a really important milestone, but the, but the work continues, the job continues, and, um, and the commitment continues. So thank you everyone for that. Um, appreciate it. Just um, another appreciation to you, Joy, to your team. Um, and everyone who went in. Also, Mary Lee and The Mill, thank you so much. I've heard nothing but really good things about the facilitation, about the way you did like really engage and take in um, what you were hearing and learning and growing and making that a process that people could use. So thank you so much for all of that as well. Um, all right, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Beeson? Yes. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Yes. 
Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Vega-Peterson? Aye. The plan is approved. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody take a breath. <laughs> yes, you can all breathe now. <laughs> all right, so now is the time when we have um, uh, board comments on non-agenda items. I'm gonna call on commissioners by district to see who has any items to discuss today. I'm gonna start with Commissioner uh, Stegman. We're gonna go with District 4. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm gonna preempt you. You may uh, have going to be uh, mentioning this, but tomorrow, or actually Saturday, we will be doing a tree planting at Nadaka Nature Park to honor the 72 individuals who lost their lives during the extreme heat event back in 2021. So thank you, Chair, uh, for your support. Uh, and it's gonna be a great day. That'll be with uh, Friends of Trees as well. And then uh, next week, I will not be here. It'll be spring break. Hopefully many of you will be doing something fun, fun for spring break. Uh, but also one of the reasons I'll be gone is I'll be attending a National Workforce Board. Uh, I sit on the Work Systems Inc executive committee and so this will be an opportunity for me to go look at some best practices every time we talk about uh, many of our greatest challenges it seems like it all leads back to workforce so I'm hoping to bring back uh, some good ideas so I will be gone next week thank you thank you Commissioner Stegman Commissioner Brim Edwards I don't have any comments all right thank you Commissioner Beeson Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to appreciate and acknowledge the uh, proclamation that was on the consent agenda um, about the, the abortion provider. Uh, my cousin is an OBGYN and an uh, abortion provider. I want to appreciate uh, the work that she's uh, been doing on behalf of uh, women who deserve the right to choose what happens to their own body. I also want to recognize um, uh, Sister Song and the amazing group of uh, women of color that coined the term and built a movement around reproductive justice uh, that really expanded our definition um, of what it means to have access to when and how uh, you choose to have a family. That's all I have to say. Thanks so much for having me virtually today. Thank you, Commissioner Reeson. Commissioner Myron. Yeah, just um, a couple of things. Uh, one, um, I had wanted to uh, give an update in terms of the uh, email that I had sent uh, reaching out about uh, the county and uh, feeling that the county is not upholding statutory responsibility as the local mental health authority. And um, we will be meeting, uh, I will be at a meeting with the chair and I believe behavioral health leadership with director Ebony Clark next week. So just wanted to give a board, uh, the board an update regarding that because I think it's really important. Um, it's a couple of months after I made my uh, request, but this is great that it's happening. Um, I also wanted to call out one thing from, we just never have time at these meetings and the clock feels like it's being run, but uh, at the, um, joint meeting with the city council and county commission. I think there was a really important point that I, I feel we should be um, elevating and talking about as the time goes on around the joint office IGA. I think it was glossed over a bit, but that will, it sounds like it has been a decided that will it will be allowed to expire and that's a big deal. And I think that that should be highlighted um, and I uh, hope that will be part of ongoing conversations. And then another thing that I'll reach out to fellow commissioners about is that um, Oregon statute provides uh, an opportunity to set up um, intergovernmental entities that are sort of extra governmental. So with a more independence um, that can govern areas where uh, it can be challenging to have some of the, um, to have it be exclusively political oversight, it's measure uh, ORS section 190.010. And uh, I had brought this up back in December and never got a response about why it would not be considered in terms of an approach to homelessness. Um, and I would love to talk about that so we can have some independence, accountability, and oversight in a different way over some of the structures addressing homelessness. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, and I just really want to clarify the, the in, 
the, in no way is the IGA actually being dissolved. In fact, both the City of Portland and the Multnomah County Board will receive um, in April, um, uh, you know, board agenda items um, about extending the IGA. So if, the, if that's what you heard, that was, that was um, not correct. And so we wanna make sure that you've got the information. Um, I think the mayor and I both talked about our intention to bring forward the continuation and extension of the IGA. That's, that's part of, in, in, that's actually the basis of all of the work that we were doing. I got, um, I got an email from Serena that said the opposite of that. So um, we, can, we can talk about that. Or I don't know if you wanna talk, I don't, we can talk about that offline, but it yeah. was said at board staff and I confirmed it with email to Serena Cruz. So I'm surprised and I'm, I'm glad to hear this and maybe I just misunderstood, but it sounded pretty clear. Well, we'll but definitely ongoing clarify. conversation. We will definitely clarify, um, but I want to make sure that it's clear um, that this has been a really incredible amount of work between the city and the county and um, staff, especially, to move us forward in a way that that um, really gets to a place where we have a shared understanding, a renewed relationship, and a com an ongoing commitment to working together on this. Um, I, I would uh, just on that note, I would ask that we get a um, before it's a final draft completely baked that commissioners have an opportunity. Um, so while um, the chair's office and the mayor's office have been involved in the in the negotiations, um, since our joint session, we really haven't had any sort of visibility to the, um, the actual draft. And it's always um, challenging to get something that like this is baked and we can't go in and completely negotiated it just would it would be I think helpful and useful um, to get that in midstream versus at the fine at the final moment um, I would appreciate that yeah absolutely and we you know I think the ongoing there's actually still uh, city and county um, meetings and conversations in fact that was also mentioned on Tuesday about the um, the staff coming together to have another um, conversation about this and I see um, Serena thank you chair Vega Peterson and commissioners Really briefly, I'm Serena Cruz um, for the record. Just a quick clarification. The Joint Office IGA is going away, being replaced with the HRS IGA, which incorporates, it's not expiring in the sense of it doesn't exist. Those pieces and elements are being incorporated into the Homeless Response System IGA. So it's not as if the impact is that it's gone, it's a new version. We've started anew with the Homeless Response System IGA. And this is why it'd be really important for us to have a look at, to see where we are so we can understand the structure and if we have some in, input before it gets to us at a final bake point because it would it'd be good to understand if there's a, I mean, I'm relieved to hear there's a whole new structure because if you looked at it before, there was something like 16 or 17 right. amendments. Like you couldn't even actually tell what the agreement was. Um, going through the old amendments, so I'm glad it's going to be a new structure. But I would just ask before it gets finalized that we have an opportunity. I can't speak for the city, and I can't speak for the commissioners, but I would like to see the direction we're heading and like at least the major scaffolding um, that we're building with this city, um, so that I'm not one of the you know at the last minute like raising a concern or an issue I have. Yeah. So I will say um, a thank you, Serena Cruz, for for uh, CEO Cruz for clarifying. I will say um, none of the IGAs are final until the boards vote on them, right? That is, and as soon as we have something to share, we will definitely do that. I think if everybody will recall last fall when we actually started this process, um, there was um, material that was shared out to the board to reflect on, to um, give comment on, and, and we will continue that process as well. Um, okay, I wanted to just, um, uh, note a couple things. Uh, Commissioner Beeson, thank you for reflecting on the um, consent agenda item about um, the uh, National um, Abortion Providers Day. I think that was a really important thing and I'm glad we had some folks testifying around it. Um, I also really wanted to um, end the day with some gratitude for the folks who have been involved with the Homelessness Response Action Plan and the Fentanyl 90 Day Emergency over the many weeks and months, um, which has been um, really accumulated into like this this really um, important week in Multnomah County around both of those initiatives as well as the West so it's a big a big week for Multnomah County um, you know it is um, it is hard work to do to be the safety net provider for a community um, it's not 
popular work, but it is so, so critical, and the way that we do it is so critical as well. Um, so I really want to thank everyone who's involved. I also wanted to thank the folks. There were more than 100 providers, um, people with lived experience, and leaders in illicit substance work who um, attended the, um, the um, summit on Thursday, or sorry, on Wednesday. And so I want to thank Dr. Bruno and the staff at the health department for hosting that and for doing that work of bringing it together. Um, it was very meaningful and, um, and positive work, and I really appreciate that. All right, so that concludes the today's business. Um, with there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned.